This is the Wheel of Time Spoilers podcast. But we are here to talk today about episode one, episode one of the show. Yes. And I feel like we should make it very, very clear to our viewers, just in case anyone happened to find us uh, through the algorithm or through just looking at reaction videos, we are full spoilers out Yeah. with respect to the books. We're following the show the same as everyone else, but we are a full right. book spoilers podcast. So if you are never going to read the books or have read all the books, you're safe here. If you are in the process of reading the books, run away, <laughs> run away screaming. <laughs> we are definitely here to talk about the show, but we will be bringing in full spoilers from the entire book series without a second thought. So And full spoilers for whatever's out for the show so far. Right, like I might reference stuff also in episode that, yes. three. Yes, so even though right at this moment True. only the first three episodes are out, and we're not, not going to talk about anything beyond that, beyond speculation. Um, I also believe we should talk about the first animated bit as part of this oh. one because that is part I of the first episode. I haven't had a chance to watch them yet. Um, so I'm still ignorant of how that works. Okay, so live reaction to the breaking <laughs> right here with a radio. What do you say? Oh, you ready for it? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah. So yeah, first reaction. What do you think? Oh, that's so cool. I love the format of it being like a lesson that like a brown is giving to a bunch of novices. Um, I love the way that they've again condensed the world building and condensed the storytelling to tell the story faster than they did originally. They're still telling the story. Um, they've got so many pieces, both of the original prologue, as well as a few pieces of um, fan art, as well as real <laughs> fan art. What do you uh, mean I saw art? a lot of different tributes in that. Okay. Uh, I saw I, I saw a tribute to Winter Dragon, as well as a tribute oh. to some other <laughs> actual very cool art. I, did, I missed um, the Winter Dragon tribute. Where was that? The sword blade, when he looks in the sword blade and then turns yeah. it Is that like a, a mirror. Uh -huh. They did that in Winter Dragon. That was the coolest part of Winter Dragon was how he looked neat and tidy in the mirror. And then they panned around behind him and then you saw him dirty in the mirror. Okay. So, so they yeah. they employed the same kind of trick, which maybe it isn't a tribute to Winter Dragon. Maybe it's just a cool trick that filmmakers like to use. I choose to see it as a tribute to Winter Dragon. Yeah, definitely. Okay, I'll I'll go with you on that one. Yeah, you can see those eyes just haunting right there, the way he but sees like, himself versus the way he looks. Yeah. Yeah. And then th that picture of him, you know, floating on top of the mountain as he destroys it. There's a piece of art very, very similar to that mm. that I'm sure our Instagram has shared before, um, and just the whole it it feels like they brought in bits of how the legend exists in this age yeah oh nice bit. nice that's clever um i i love it i love it i'm so excited to see more of them and i'm I mean, really into this a canonical shot of you know ltt's T's face right there right that's lewis there and telemon right there that gives us a shot of his face that gives us an image for him rightly like we which is based on the him. actor because he's been cast he has been yeah okay and that's the act that, that does look like the actor yeah. Okay. I mean, I don't have the greatest memory for faces, and he hasn't made an impression, and this connection is pretty crappy. But <laughs> it sure looks like him. The picture's a lot more pixelated God, yes. for what I'm experiencing than if I were to watch well, it. It's very stylized. Myself. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the fact that they were able to do a shot for shot canonical thing with like the cloak over her face was like. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was really cool. So I, I just think a great way to, to introduce the breaking and. and um that to the audience you know even if we don't necessarily get to see it in the show like this is canonically now how the show is addressing the breaking and ltt and giving us the history now it's through the history lesson so i guess it's how the eyes to eye see the breaking well that was another really interesting thing was that we get a couple of interesting pieces we get um we have been trying to understand the breaking of the world for three thousand years they don't really know what's going on they don't they aren't giving us as much of the story as we learn it from, you know, the glass columns. Um, and also there's this whole, the entire existence of the tower is for protecting the world from another breaking. The world has barely recovered 
from the breaking. And it is the entire purpose of All Eyes to Die to do whatever it takes to prevent another breaking. It really like, venerates that the sets red up the eyes to die's. Yeah, it, it, it sets up the eyes to die's motivation. It makes the reds seem like the most eyes to die, eyes to die ever, eyes to dying. <laughs> it's it, it's a very sedai. good way to bring again bring the audience into that. I, I brilliant brilliant little extra for them to add. Cool animation. Yeah, too. and great shot of Beelzebub that looks like what we've seen in the dreams. Mm -hmm. So it's just, and yeah. also now we know what those weird little it looks like a sketch shots are from. Uh, from the trailer they were sketch. it's like oh it just looks like a sketch like what the fuck's up with that and there was a lot of theories and now we know it's because they're literally doing sketch animated yep. shorts <laughs> right and what the there couldn't have been a better way for that to be implemented no i think i actually said like i remember looking back at the video and like remember me squinting in and go that looks animated like i think there's yeah. a line and i was like yeah it, it, it was it was for this it was absolutely for this so loving that stuff love this battles one shot um love the sort of stylized um, imploding of the desk as the breaking happens. Imploding uh, of the desk? So she's looking at the map. Let's see, where is it? Oh, yeah, when it yeah. all crumbles inward. Yeah, and this, yeah, this little bit here. Yeah, that was so cool. Where she's like, and the world broke. And it's like, and then you get Literally. the shot. Literally. Oh. I don't know what city this is. If this is Parandizan, it probably an Age of Legends city, right? Because it's during the breaking. Oh, it has to be. Has yeah, to be. yeah. Yeah. So um, that's the only real city that I know of off the top of There's my head. There's a bunch of cities. Yeah. It could be any of them. This isn't the one with the Column Dawn. That's for sure. Right. Right. Unless, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is a city that got broken. Um, like, this is a city that fell apart because of the breaking. This is not where the breaking started. Definitely. And then a great shot of Dragon Mount. Mm -hmm. With the lava coming out of the top. And um, they don't make Dragon Mount as much about LTT. They make it a result of the breaking, mm -hmm. but not a result of LTT per se. Mm -hmm. Again, because they're telling us the story. So we only get what, what their perspective is of it. They don't know about LTT's final moments. Also, that shot of the hand with the dust, they think that the, in the original story, it the breaking didn't end until the last male channeler died. Now they're saying the breaking didn't end until the last male channeler was gentled. Yeah. That's a very important um, little piece of propaganda spin <laughs> to put on that and to make sure that they're all focused in, on the mission in the same mm -hmm. regimented way. I had to ask you, what do you think about that library shot? <gasps> gimme, 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 gimme. Grabby hands. <laughs> Every librarian's dream. Every Brown's dream. Every book nerd's dream is to have a library with a ladder. It is known. <laughs> yeah, <just laughs> we all. all right, and then, um, yeah, just the credits and everything. So I, I love it. Love the shot. I think that was a great way to set it up. I'm glad it's there. It's unfortunate that X-Ray is so hard to view. Um, for those of you who are wondering, I got it on the computer simply by playing Amazon Prime, you have to play the episode first, then you have to hit X-Ray bonus content, and there it is. So, but the, the trick is you have to have the episode playing, and then there's, um, what I found is if you go to the latest episode, it shows you all the previous ones, so that's the quickest way to do it. Cool. Good to know. Yeah. Oh, I hope that they show us the real Tower Library, because now they've set it up as being, looking like that, I really hope we get to see it IRL. <laughs> okay so i think we uh i don't we'll save the other animated bits for the other episodes so let's go ahead and jump into episode one of the wheel of time <laughs> i can't get through it uh sometimes i can't even say i'm just like i can't even say the full name there's an amazon <laughs> wheel of time tv show that exists and and i mean the more i watch it the more enthusiastic i am and the more amazed I am at how close they stuck to the plot, right? The first time I saw it, I only saw the differences. The last time I saw it, I saw how similar it was to the books and how much they actually brought over after thinking about other adaptations I've seen and other, other things like they kept so much. I'm amazed. So anyway, uh, I'm very enthusiastic about this. Um, of course, there are nodding. changes, but let's get into it a little bit. Um, I've only got three pages of notes. I'm nodding so hard. <laughs> <laughs> and I do believe the first thing we need to talk about is that intro. Yeah. 
I was, when I first turned it on, I was like, not sure if it was the right video because I thought, oh, this is just one of the shorts. And I was like, yep. oh shit, that's how they're starting it. Yep. Oh, that's cool. It's cool. And uh, it is a little bit of a, hey, new readers, here's an info dump, right? Like, instead of having a scrawl at the beginning or having a voice, you know, a straight up voiceover, I guess this technically is a voiceover. Um, they're giving us both the voiceover and the visual interestingness of um, Moraine. Which yeah. I, yeah. And I mean, in the spirit of doing tribute to Lord of the Rings, you have to start the series with a husky female voiceover otherwise <laughs> but what are you doing that's necessary that, yeah, that, works. <laughs> that works yeah no it's again this is one of the things about the first one that i think felt a little weird to me because again i was like wait am i just watching a short like um so i i think having this in the beginning wasn't necessarily the strongest decision as much as i like this bit if that makes sense. I think it makes less sense for us because we were watching the shorts obsessively. I yeah. think it makes total sense if you're trying to bring in people who haven't seen it yet. Fair. Yeah. So. And that's one of the things I want to talk about is like there's a huge difference between both readers and non-readers in terms of what they, they thought about this thing. And also like those of us who've been following everything obsessively and people who have just more casually been into it. So, yeah. Um, and I think on the rewatches, we're getting more of that second experience because we're not mm -hmm. so caught up in the previous uh, mindset. Yeah. And then we go to one of the other most classic pieces of filmmaking, which is a gra field of grass that then someone goes running through. This, how many times have we seen this shot? This is one of the most classic shots right. ever. And I love that they're just like tropes, 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 tropes. tropes. <laughs> There's the grass. There's the guys running. And I actually really like that cliffside shot. That's really nice. And you can see the ruins in the background, which mm -hmm. I think you were saying initially you thought were just normal rocks but later we see are much more like um not all of them are right. it's a very confusing landscape but really what this was all about to me i mean it gave us a couple of things one it showed us the channeling right the breaking of the rocks here which again those are chunks of rock not chunks of building no those are that's all distinctly true. chunks of stone i was paying very close attention and there is a mix of stone and buildings happening here you're right well you're right. i mean we see a whole city made of stone and shutter logos, but whatever. Um, and then the four red sisters. Yeah, is there five? I thought there was five. Yeah. It's Leandrin and four others. Well, I'm impressed. I... Yeah, I'm impressed. Okay. Um, Leandra looks fantastic. Love the zealotry. Love the way she approaches everybody. Just her commitment mm -hmm. to her cause and when she says like you know you you should thank me this is a gift that echoes a lot of what cad swain says in book 10. that's one of those things where it's like language from later in the books is being brought forward to illustrate the world here and now i noticed that there's a lot of lines from the books not necessarily in the characters mouths who say them um you know for example the wars uh, line from tom is said by yeah uh, the Marin. Marin. Alvier. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I'm loving that, mm -hmm. bringing all of RJ's creative genius closer up to the front. Compressing. Compressing. Totally. I totally. love it. <laughs> um, and then what we the big reveal here is that the guy he's with is uh, insane imagining. Uh, yeah. He's, he's an LTT figure. Yeah. <laughs> this is foreshadowing for Rand big time. Big time, right? Like... I also, maybe you suggest how we're going to have LTT. Like, every man's madness is different, so this might not be how we do LTT, but this might be how we do LTT. I mean, it's it's sort of how I imagined it. Um, and I, I've talked about this before, but, like, Harvey from Farscape, um, there's a few other characters like that, where either, like, you flash into a mindscape where you're in your own head and it's two people talking in, like, an imaginary room, or you have the voiceover or you just have that person walking around and there's only one person who can see them. And you can do various levels of that depending on how insane Rand is at the time. Yeah, totally. But yeah, this guy is giving us our view of what it looks like to be a man who's mad and channeling. Yeah. It's just, oh, yeah, let's open up with that. And the wheel of time like on screen, I can't, I can't. <laughs> I mean, I'm having trouble processing that sometimes too, yeah. It also gives the idea that it's a lot more common, necessarily. Like, these reds, like, they got him, and now they're going to go get Loghain, and, like, it's, oh, yeah, we just got one on the way. Like, it seems like men who can channel are a fairly common thing that pop up, maybe. 
Well, in canonically in the timeline, there's been a whole bunch recently. Like, oh, it's like what? Like, clearly the end of the world is coming because we're suddenly catching way more men who can channel than we have in the last like 200 years. Suddenly, we're getting tons more. Um, so I think maybe we're seeing that, or it's just more common, and the whole culling conversation is sort of going to be sidelined, and po- channels will be at a fairly steady population. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's an option, I think. Um, so she then, what I assume is gentles him on the spot, right? We see yeah. that clenching of yeah. the fist and just, like, she's got... And a, then he so, screams, it's a mm-hmm. gift. Yeah, that's definitely gentling. Right. And, which is not something she's supposed to be doing. We think. We think, yeah. You I'm know, very in, in curious if that's going to be something that they keep or not. Is is this an illegal action in show canon? Because it is in book canon, mm-hmm. but it might not be in show canon. I mean, I'm totally okay with it not being in show canon. I could see them being a more brutal institution in show canon. That works. I just, we don't know yet. Um, I, can I say that I've gotten more used to the Aes Sedai rings as well? They, they're starting to look more like badges of, more like, you know, how like cops have like a, you know, a big visible badge on. Like, to me, that's sort of what that looks like. And I kind of, yeah. I like the ring color being the Aja color. I'm... I'm okay with the rings. They're yeah. growing on me, but I still miss the shawl imagery. And But I agree with what you're saying about how it's like a badge. It's not like, I mean, I liked the old ring design. I liked that it was a subtle wedding band style ring. I liked that, but mm-hmm. I can live with them wearing a badge as a piece of jewelry as a, as a change. Like, I am curious, though, about how accepted and rings are going to be handled. I like, do you accept to not get rings? Uh, I thought maybe they get a ring either without the stone, or maybe you pick your Aja when you join the accepted ranks. I'm going to go with the former, not the latter. Yeah. There's no way that you're going to pick your Aja as an accepted. Yeah, but I could see them giving them like a more simple ring, kind of like an engagement ring before right, a wedding right. ring. Maybe that's going to be where they give us the original ring. It's going to be the really plain one. Nice. <laughs> They're going to yeah, be like, we, we that was only it. the accepted ring. And now this is the real ring. Uh, yeah. They did mention a shawl in the short, though. They did mention shawls. Um, and, and that's something we haven't seen necessarily as something formal. We generally see them just in a very red dress. But, you know, maybe maybe the shawl still is a thing, just not brought out very often. Or maybe they like changed it at some point. They're like, our, we need to update our our look. <laughs> yeah, or maybe it's like an old school. Like they used to wear shawls, but pff, the the old, oh, that that's so outdated. Only ancient Aes and I would think about doing that. And Cod Swain shows up with a shawl. And Cat on. Swain's gonna, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Cod Swain's gonna show up. But like, yeah. she's, she's the only yeah, one who still wears it. You know, so something like that. Like uh, like the way top hats are. You know, it's like old old fashioned. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that that gives us sort of that shot, and then we have Moraine basically being like, "Nope, that's not the guy." And Land's like, "But he could be." And Moraine's like, "Yeah, he's toast." So we're just gonna assume that's not the guy. Yeah, she gives him this look of like, "I need to believe that wasn't him because otherwise the entire world is over, and I can't deal with that." I also, this is where he does that perfect Spock eyebrow that I gushed about in our shallow dive. Um, it's just his, their, their faces both. That. <laughs> that, that, that just that like ever so right subtle look. Uh-huh. Like it's just, this is Lan's face giving her just a really, okay, you're the boss. Let's go. Like there's so much in, in that. And it's very, very Spock. Um, and I'm very happy about it. So then we get that like zooming up so you can see there's rocks here, but it looks like almost beyond the valley. It's like rocks on the left, but on the right, there's an actual building. Yeah, that's what I was saying is it's it's not all buildings. That's part of why I can be forgiven for thinking it was rocks is because the closer one are rocks and you get farther away and you can do more tricks of the eye. Um, the other thing I do think we need to address here is the line about there are rumors of Tavirin. Sure. What? How are there rumors of Tavirin? How do these kids not know what Tavirin are? We're not seeing Tavirin us about them. Like, just none of that makes sense to me. Because, like, Matt wasn't lucky. No. He's distinctly unlucky. Mm-hmm. So I think there's two two possible solutions. 
One, the Dark Friends are already having dreams. The Dark One knows of who he's pursuing. And he's been sending his Dark Friends after them. And so, like Dina, we can reference episode three here. Mm-hmm. She says, I've been seeing the four of you in my dreams. Five. Maybe, she says uh, five. She says five. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So, mm, there is that. There's also the possibility, um, Min, uh, it's Moraine is supposed to have already talked to Min before she goes, you know, in the books again, uh, before she goes into the two rivers. We're not sure that's going to happen, but it's entirely possible that Min said there's, there's, but then she wouldn't say rumors. Yeah, I just. Mm-hmm. That's a tough line. It's a line that needs explanation. It's, it's, there's a, a number of lines in episode one that we need explanation. And, and I do firmly believe we're going to flash back to Emmons Field and learn some more about what's been going on before Winter Night. I think we have okay. to. Like, I, th- I think, or during Winter Night, I think we're going to see Tan. Like, we already saw, we already did one flashback of Nynaeve. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm willing to bet that we're also going to see another one with uh, Rand and Tam. Because we're going to, we don't want to, they didn't want to give away the blood snow yet. But how, why are we, how else are we going to get those flashbacks? We're going to see yeah. Tam tell that tale. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, and then, and then we'll be able to reference like, "Hey, Rand's actually walking around with that tail in his head. We just didn't know it." We're gonna see some more. With, yeah. I think we're gonna see more Perrin and uh, Lila. I think mm-hmm. we're gonna see mm-hmm. more flashback of that. Um, it's poss- entirely possible with Egwene and some other stuff. Uh, it's, but we're gonna flashback with Egwene and her testing, right? So I'm more and more convinced that that's not a dream sequence where she gets the colors on her. I'm convinced that's gonna be flashback. So I uh, like. I'm, I've got th- at least three flashbacks that I'm convinced are going to happen, so I'm not be, be surprised if we have four or five for each of the characters. We've already had one, and I'm convinced there's three more coming. So, yeah, I bet each character gets a flashback in each of the episodes. Okay. We've had nine Eves, and yeah. I bet we had one each. But with nine Eve with the Trolloc? Yep. I think that, that counts as a flashback. Mm-hmm. Like a flash sideways. But, yeah, okay. well, but no, I mean, we... It flashes back an entire five hours. No, oh, okay, no, I guess a few multiple, days. No, multiple a days. few days. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we're... But still, it's not like episodes. a before winter night. It's like it's the beginning okay, of episode fair. three, and we're flashing back to the episodes, the events of episode one, which okay. is multiple days earlier. Okay. Uh, so. I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and I think that, that, yes, it's kind of a flash sideways, but we're going to get further and further away from that as we advance in the story. So. Hmm. Well, I hope we get a better flashback for Nynaeve that actually tells more of her backstory, not just how she dealt with Winter Night. Oh, I'm thinking it's all mostly Winter Night flashbacks. Oh, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Right. Gives us context, but it's... Okay, okay. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I Yeah, I'd like explanations for why there's rumors of Tavirin, Um, because it just doesn't fit, and there's no explanations. So they're going to need to give us something. Agreed. And I agreed that it's possible that they're going to. <laughs> and that's the only time anyone has said the word Tavirin in this entire series so far that I can tell. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like right in the beginning, yeah. pre- pre-cut episode one, and then nothing. Like, from then on, all she's talking about is the Dragon Reborn. One of you might be the Dragon Reborn. No one's saying Tavirin. Okay, so onwards to this whole ceremony, which... I felt very vindicated about my whole like this is a hair is a big part of culture and family and heritage and this is a really big deal in the real world and it's nice to see it represented here and in the days since the episode I've heard a lot of people say that this hair representation is really great and uh, the lecture inside the episode proves that I was on the right track with uh, where, where I was thinking with that. And it's nice to just see that, like, no, this is important. And it gives us more more context for how Nynaeve's relationship with her braid works. Um, if, you know, Egwene doesn't have her braid and she chooses not to have it, like, we're getting inside her head now rather than just that sort of random omnipotent bits of world building. It's actually being spelled out in a way that's very believable. Shown instead of told. What you have to do to mm-hmm. make this, you know, you can be told in a book, you have to be shown in a series. <clears throat> And here we're being shown how important it is that the braids are to the culture of the two rivers. Also, one thing I'd like to point out in this shot, her dress looks like it's dyed with the colors from the pool. And it does look like it's maybe still wet. Yep. Or drying Um, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like it's damp. Like it was wet and now it's... um, Yeah, her hair's dry. But I... 
I'm not sure and if I'm seeing colors was, on the dress or not. Wasn't her hair unbraided during that? Yes. So I, I'm convinced, again, yeah, I, I used to be, oh, dream. I'm convinced now that this is entirely, why is Nynaeve cleaning the pool? They had all the colors in it. I was wondering about her cleaning the pool. Yeah. 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 So this is after that ceremony, she gets pushed in. This is the last piece of a many part ceremony. Yes. Yes. I am so interested to find out because, I mean, I was waiting for that pool scene, you know? And then when we immediately cut to Nynaeve cleaning out the pool, I was just like, what? I want that. Why? So they're going to give it to us later. I believe that. But, oh, I'm so interested to learn the order of events. So we get her pushed in. She struggles, and then she accepts and flows with it. Oh my god, foreshadowing for, hmm, Sidine? No, Sidar. Uh, Sidar. So, um, and then there's... <laughs> that neck. Yeah. I, I swear to god, that... <laughs> you just see, like, this exposed neck. It's, it's a funny, funny shot. I just, I don't know why that one always stood out to me, but... It, you can see the musculature in her back. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but then go go ahead to when it's panning up from her after she turns over. First of all, she goes onto the braid. Very sweet. Love that. Um, but then, okay, stop here. So there's some really cool Tarot stuff in what's happening with Egwene here um, that I happen to recognize. Okay, so two things. She's very much going on a um, hero's journey kind of thing. She's being positioned as the hero in the hero's journey, Joseph Campbell. And at first she is thrown off a cliff. This is very much that opening shot with her and Nynaeve is like the fool, which is the very first card of the major arcana of Tarot. And the fool means beginnings. It's an, aus an auspicious start for new beginnings, innocence, inexperience, trusting in the experience of the journey a carefree person, and they are often depicted as a person about to walk off a cliff. So clear symbology right there. I mean, someone getting pushed off a cliff, less um, how the card goes. But in general, fall walking off a cliff, the start of a new journey for an innocent, inexperienced person. So yeah, that is literally the position of the hanged one or the hanged man. Uh, which has the leg bent over into that four shape. That's the really distinct how you know that's who it is. And it's a, I've seen this body position used in so many stories where it clearly represents um, the hanged man, who obviously is a slightly more intense card associated with death. Um, but specifically, uh, it's associated with ultimate surrender and sacrifice and being suspended in time. Yeah, no, so this in no way foreshadows Egwene, am I right? None of that applies to Egwene. <laughs> none of it. <laughs> not a, not a so, single little bit of it. Nope. Um, I'm very pleased with having spotted those and how well it fits her. And I want us all to keep an eye out for other tarot card uh, references we may see as we go through this. Because those are some really common ones, but they're not the only recognizable ones, maybe, possibly. Yeah, I'm so. not as familiar, but I think that's a great source of, of things to find. Things to look out yeah. for. Also, um, <laughs> fangs and flames, right? I've listened mm -hmm. to those. So Yes, yes, that mm -hmm. too. <laughs> uh, we go to Tam and Rand on the road, which we don't get a fade, but we do get some rocks getting disturbed. Yeah, which is like, totally could happen. A rock fall absolutely rock makes sense. I mean, those steep hills, these are very heavily eroded. There's been like ice wedging because it's still cold. Like rocks rolling downhill spontaneously absolutely could happen mm -hmm. or there's someone sneaking around up there <laughs> yeah, and they knocked possible. a rock you know, we don't know that entirely could <laughs> be the thing you know we, we don't we never entirely rule that out mm -mm. or it could be a trollic but most likely yeah i mean it, we hear the bulls but he does say they're being pushed down and we assume they're being pushed down by trollics in the hills um yeah in the books they talk about how, like scouts right mm -hmm. it's been weeks months winter sorry i interrupted you <laughs> Well, no, in the books we talk about how um, the wolves are killing a bunch of sheep and how we really do think that's just Trollocs in the hills over the winter. 
getting ready to attack. Yeah. Um, I Tam and, of course, Bella, the shaggy horse. Mm, it's so hard to see him as a good father figure, except that he's Tam, oh. who is best dad. So... Um, it's it's amazing. I love his spear. I love his down home worn in. Like he's just so tam. And that, he's just so embodies tam. And that spear is the one he uses to stab the trollock when it first comes in through the door before he gets the sword. So he's he has that ready. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And Bella is obviously just beautiful and wonderful. wonderful. Goofy Rand. Rand fuzzy sweater. <laughs> Such a dork. So cute. Um. A lot of people thought that he drew on the raven here when he draws his bow. Mm. When the rocks is there fall, a raven? there is no raven that I could see. But yeah, it does, no, it's totally, that's what it feels yeah, like. It feels like that shot. And it could be. And that's what could I've noticed be. he does a lot, is he's like, oh, I'll take this shot that, um, you know, it's a little bit of the, him turning on the fade and seeing a dark eye and getting suspicious. It's a little bit him seeing the raven and wanting to be like, that's odd, and pointing the the bow at it like they don't have slings that he has a bow you know so but he's taking like two or three different shots and putting them together in a, a third shot that does the same thing as those two or three shots just in a slightly different way um but it's just a remarkably how much he's kept the feel of the books by doing that while condensing down a lot of the material that's how we know that he actually cares is because he he knows the books well enough to do that <laughs> it's, it's amazing and i love it mm -hmm. Um, great shot of the river, and then we come into the two rivers, sort of seeing all the folks mm. and the people. And... Which it's just, there's so many details. Yeah, I don't... The sets are so complex. Mm. There's so many items. It's not clean. The costumes are a little bit too clean. They get dirtier as the episodes go yeah. on, which is awesome. Yeah. I enjoy that. But the set is not too clean. The set is like a well-ordered village, but it it has period piece vibes to me. Like there's a lot of little tiny details that I'm sure everyone and their mother in the content creator community is uh, analyzing to death. Um, but I love that. I love how much love is in it. And I have a little bit of forgiveness for clean clothes at the beginning of the episode because it literally is, you know, the biggest holiday. Everyone's wearing their best, their cleanest, you know, no one's going. And it's not like these people don't have like soap. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. once it's they just, start there's... traveling. Yeah. It's a little bit out of the box, clean and shiny when it starts, but it ages quickly. Yeah. And I just, I don't care. I just don't care. See, I, I just really never found it. Like, I look at these things and I look at the clothing and I see. The items are dirty. Yeah. The clothes are cleaner. Okay. Like the white cloaks, there's not like just a worn edge mm -hmm. on their stuff. All their stuff looks like they put it on for the first time last week, sure. which is not canonically what they're doing. Canonically, this is what they wear all the time. Right, so, like, right. But the wear patterns are starting as as our Emmett's Field Five like travel. You see their clothes getting dirtier. So I'm like, this. I'm I'm okay. Um, I, yeah, I'm okay with it being a little symbolic. It's fine. Yeah. It's fine. I'm fine. Um, <laughs> one of the things I noticed is the no amount of jewelry is a lot higher than I would have suspected. Everybody's wearing multiple rings, I'm multiple bracelets, it. lots of piercings, so um, many yeah. earrings. Oh. Yeah, I am loving how many glittery things. I'm shiny, mm -hmm. shiny. <laughs> I like shiny. <laughs> and, and again, I, I think it has changed from the books because in the books, when we see a septum piercing in um, the sea folk, that's an unusual thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, which it's nice bringing the uh, concept of ta of like uh, tattoos and piercings being like less exotic. Yeah. You know, and like really de exotifying. Mm -hmm. Like that, that's a good move. It is, because, and again, in the 90s when the books were written, tattoos and piercings made the sea folk more exotic. Now it's like, yeah, me and everybody and my bartender and everybody I know has tattoos and piercings. That makes that more common in a way for people to express themselves. So I feel like that's very much yeah. modernizing the books into just the common, the, the current era of like, yeah, ring, nose rings don't make you exotic. Sorry, it just makes you the person who likes nose rings. Yeah. Totally. I'm, I'm loving it. Bum, 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 bum. No. <laughs> Shush. Shush. <laughs> uh, Matt's great dice roll there. Love that. Excellent yeah. dice roll. Yeah. Six. Mm. Um, yeah. I wonder if that's a 666 six, six reference. Uh, <laughs> rolling six. I mean, yeah. why not? Yeah, whatever. But it's obviously <laughs> just a terrible roll, right? Like, out of four... Mm. 
times six, you could get a 24 and he got a six. Like that's about as low as you can get. Um, yeah, that's a, it's a very, very low roll. Um, and not even being all ones, which might mean something, right? Yeah. So he, and which I, I, we do a good job of that sets up his character as someone who's losing money. Let's, let's start talking about, let's talk about Matt's backstory change here. Okay. Um, as, cause this is where they really bring up the gambler, right? This is the guy who is trying to make money desperately and failing because his family's broke. He's broke. He's not lucky in any way, shape or form, which again is not necessarily the case in the books. He is a little bit lucky before yeah. hand. Um, yeah. That was something I noticed is, is he's not a little extra lucky no. in, in this, um, which is fine. Mm -hmm. I'm fine with that. Um, so there's there's so much to unpack with the whole Matt thing. Um, I like that they, we start out with seeing him gambling. Yep. I like that that's like that's going to be his thing, just mm -hmm. in case you were confused. And but the part where he's doing it, I mean, first of all, we're seeing a lot more coin in the two rivers than is canonically in the books. Um, there's, generally, the two rivers is less isolated. I'm noticing they've got a lot more rumors. Um, like Perrin's the one that has the rumor about the wars in Gildan. Um, they have coin. There's just a lot. The I, the isolation is less. And, which is than more it was in the books. reasonable. I always felt like the isolation was a little unreasonable in the books when they like they go from completely isolated to a major metropolitan center just like overnight. Like yeah, this balances it out better. This yeah. is a place that it prides itself on how isolated it can be. But it's not truly isolated. Yeah. They get war refugees every time there's a war, according right. to Marin. Like, so that that whole thing that happens in book four, where it's like, ooh, styles from elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Wow. Like, that's well, not going to happen in quite the same way. Yeah. It, it never uh, rang true to me that Two Rivers Tabak was such a popular item. And yet Two Rivers never had any interaction with the outside world. Like, both yeah. of those things seem to not necessarily always work. And again, I always chalk that up to an eye of the worldism. Um, and and sure. You know, that, my favorite thing is that, like, we have a chance here to correct some of the eye of the worldisms, and that right there is yeah. one of them, right? Also, Matt not being canonically lucky before he leaves the two rivers and becomes severe, and, or before the dagger gives him his luck, or whatever we, let's identify yeah. what actually gives him the luck and have that give him the luck instead of this weird amalgam of different sources that maybe it's Lanfear with the Tarangriol, maybe it's the dagger, maybe it's Taviran, maybe it's all three, you know, like... I'd love to see more clarification on where his luck comes from. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Totally. But yeah, the whole making him pour down on his luck in the full on socioeconomic sense is an interesting choice that there would be more social stratification yeah. um, in the two rivers and less community enforcement of standard of living. I feel like this wouldn't have happened in the books version of the two rivers. Like, the family wouldn't have been allowed to be quite that much in squalor, the, no matter what the problems at home were. Book two rivers is a little more um, shire. Yeah. This is a little more actual medieval town with not everybody's doing great. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and <clears throat> Yeah, like I said, and, and it feels more at home. You know, the Two Rivers always felt like this special, weird place that doesn't match all the other realistic places where there is poverty, where there is crime. It's like, oh, well, this is a special place where our Taviran come from, and they got raised differently because it's a different place that, that is almost a little isolated magic kingdom in and of itself. Yeah, it's this is more real. Yeah. This this makes our heroes more relatable, um, which is which is nice, but it is sad to see the two rivers having this kind of dysfunctional family just existing in plain sight and no one taking care of them. It feels a little out of place. I would disagree, though. We always had the cop Coplins and the Congress, right? We just sort of made... They're just reputable. Yeah. It's it, They're not in distress, and we see them here being very boisterous and rowdy. Like, they're the rednecks that have, like, cheap beer and loud motorized toys. Mm -hmm. They're fun, they're loud, they're a lot, and maybe they don't have the same standards as you, but they're not hurting sure. in the same way that Matt's family clearly is. But at the same time, clearly Matt's family's problems have to do as much with emotions and pride and marital problems rather than resources per se. Right, right. 
<clears throat> so like there is an element of like you, what can you do right it's you know it's not like they don't have a house their house is filthy but like they don't clean it type situation it's one of those more like how much of that is they're not their own dysfunction and alcoholism and inability to just function as a family is causing the problems versus you know this is the society's letting them down Right. Yeah. And, and they're very proud people. I mean, we see that with Matt. He does take the money eventually when Rand and Perrin give it to him. But like pride, pride is a real thing. Um, and I mean, I hate I hate to say that I like this change because it's terrible. It's sad. But I like the realism of it because this is a very real human story that people come from intensely abusive and traumatic and poverty stricken environments and have to make really difficult decisions and have to deal with that trauma. And like, that's an extremely normal story across the human experience. And heroes and fantasy stories usually have much more shiny upbringings or, yeah. I mean, you've got like Aladdin, mm -hmm. you know, where he lives on the street, but more often it's more privileged people so it's there's some rags to riches yeah but I, i'm glad we don't just yeah. have thing one thing two and thing three leaving the two rivers right like the books there are very little differentiating yeah. the three boys it's once they leave that they really become differentiated other than the stereotypes of blacksmith trickster and you know protagonist archer yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah and jesus right. <laughs> yeah but yeah so i'm interested to see if they continue to handle that with the sensitivity it deserves given that that is a real lived experience sure. for people and we don't just go with poverty porn for the sake of sparkles like let's actually have a, a thoughtful discussion about how that trauma affects him and that guilt goes with him and i think i think they're likely to do that yeah. because there's a few problematic things in the series so far but overall it's very sensitive so and also like how he's picked up the dagger and, and seen that as valuable uh -oh. And yeah, I mean, now that we've seen how crappy his home is, a f ruby the size of a ruby that's expensive enough to buy a farm makes a lot more sense as a metric of success. And can I just say, as a, a former potter, those mugs are fan fucking tastic. Well constructed, <laughs> lots of volume, big handles. Ugh, love those love mugs. Those, love those mugs. I always look for mugs in fantasy yeah. adaptations. So yeah, he gambles with more <laughs> That's time. a really cool. Yeah, it's a cool thing to look for. Yeah. He gambles one more time, loses, and then he goes off to steal that bracelet from the girl he was talking to. Which is now it's now a good time to go on a rant about how colorism is in the show, or is it is it too soon? Go for it. Yeah, if if you want to bring it up now, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> um. So, side tangent, uh, Discord discourse um i've been avoiding the discourse as it exists in the world for the most part um i really don't want to be part of the echo chamber i want to have my own opinions about the show so i'm avoiding the discourse um as much as i humanly can i'm avoiding all my friends reaction videos i'm trying to give you guys the purest me and, well me and seth reaction that i can uh, see I, i'm i'm that... definitely immersing myself <laughs> in the filth and, and filtering and finding what i can and then trying to just bring the positive things and the, the, the catches and the interesting things to the, the screen that i can cool well i'm not i'm glad you're doing that <laughs> i don't have the emotional fortitude to wade through all that bullshit and i don't want to sound like the echo chamber i want to be pure so to speak with the exception of when black and brown people talk about colorism showing up in the casting. That is a piece of discourse I am keeping up on because I clearly do not have that experience. Um, and so basically, uh, I'm, I guess, hmm, should I explain what colorism is? Do I need to do you that? Need to Can do I that. assume? Yes. Every... Okay. So colorism is a manifestation of white supremacy that exists within the non-white part of the population, the global majority, the population of global majority. Um, basically, it is that lighter is better and darker is worse. So you have the it's not just white versus black. It is lighter black versus darker black. That pattern persists the whole way down. So you're basically the, saying that like America does racism the same way it does everything else. We take the extreme version of it, but the whole world sees it on the spectrum, but it's still racism in both places. 
<laughs> I mean, it exists here in all of its nuance, and it exists sure. in the world in all of its extremism. Um, but I actually did an exercise once at university. I went to an after it was an extracurricular thing, but it was while I was there. Um, and they had us do like the invisible knapsack checklist, and then sort ourselves by how many checks we had. Um, and we were perfectly arrayed along a color spectrum, a color ramp. Like we were perfectly sorted, like 50 people, I think, and a lot of people of color uh, for Corvallis, <laughs> um, where I was very white town, but very, there was a lot of people of color there uh, and black people. And we were perfectly arrayed along a color ramp when we did the like 27 point checklist exercise. So that is colorism in a nutshell, is that racism gets worse the darker you are. And one of the places that this manifests that is really, really um, common is in film, specifically in casting. Mm -hmm. So there was a comment that I read, I think on Twitter, from a uh, black person or a mixed race person who said, my dad, who is white, can look at the cast and see, you know, morally gray character, excellent father figure, probably the savior. Me, a mixed race person, can look at the cast and see, you know, fiery apprentice, you know, dedicated apprentice, fiery teacher, uh, badass warrior. My mom, who is very dark and black, can see a nameless woman who gets stolen from, a disreputable traitor, and a sadistic inquisitor. And that commenter and other commenters I've read have said it's early in the season. There's a lot of diversity in the cast. There is time for this to balance out and not seem as racist as it looks as we go through the series. And the huge amount of diversity in the casting is wonderful. Mm -hmm. And we love that. But it's a little frustrating that the extremely dark characters are in extremely not great roles yep. so far. That's an issue that we should all just be cognizant of as we enjoy the series and its casting and just think about it and listen to people who are black and brown when they talk about this and do not fucking tell them what their experience is. Pro tip, don't do that. Just yeah. listen. The one hole I'm glad they haven't fallen into is the magic black man coming up and solving all your problems yet. But, you know, that's definitely a... Uh, hole I've seen other fantasy fall into. Um, that's a very, Yes, very the magical cultural. black friend is a real problem and yeah. I'm honestly kind of worried that Loyal's going to do that. Yeah. Loyal might be the good one and the magical black friend all rolled into one. Mm -hmm. That would not make me happy um, at all. I don't think that would make a lot of other people happy. But yeah, we are so far not going there. And I totally had another point I was going to bring up just now. And then I forgot it because this is a really intense <laughs> topic to, to digest yeah. and to to talk about. But this this will it'll come up more. Oh, that was the thing. One of the commenters pointed out that there was actually an upgrade with Pod Unfane. He was originally an anti-Jewish trope. Yeah. Coming into town as a peddler with a big hooked nose and a reputation for uh, being cutthroat and penny pinching yeah yeah yeah, yeah there's that's so i think we've talked about that you know yeah it's it's not the greatest i don't think i'd ever noticed that mm. that he was an anti-semitic trope i don't think i'd ever picked up on that um but when it was pointed out it's like oh no. oh my god yeah no. so you know good on them for moving away from that and I love the performances of Fane and Valda. Like, those actors nailing Absolutely. it. I don't have a problem yeah, with yeah, that. Yeah. Um, which is, again, where, like, maybe as the casting continues, we end up seeing that the, the larger pattern is not that. It just happens to be the way it was introduced in the first three episodes, mm -hmm. which is, ugh. But we can live if that's just the beginning. Mm. You know, I'm fine this... with moving away from Mickiness, but you can stumble right on right. Into something yeah, and this, else. this is something where, like, we really do praise Jordan for what he did, but that, that we're not going to say there aren't problematic parts of the Wheel of Time, right? Like, oh, that, yeah, no. that, that I'm just going, oh, wow, faint. Oh, wow, that's more problematic than I thought. <laughs> than I, rem I remember thinking about. Okay, anyway. Yeah. yeah. Which is why it's good for us to participate in the discourse to a certain right, extent right. um also to veer us back into more happy territory Please. i'm a little sad they've used this actress already because she's basically how i imagine two on minus the hair 
So I'm a little sad that they've already um, used her on this role because now she can't be too long. Well, oh, that, there's the goofy smile. Egwene comes in. Uh, as everyone, everyone claps, claps because apparently everyone knows it's her that that's day. What's yeah, that's like speaking uh, bar mitzvah or something. Like it, or, you know, but you're 20. You've joined the women's circle. She's become part of the almost say ruling class of the two rivers. Right. This isn't just becoming an adult. This is like it's an interesting difference, right? Because it wasn't hey, welcome, you're a woman. It's welcome to the women's circle. Yeah, I was confused about mm -hmm. that because they're aging her up, which means that she should have had her braid already. Unless the braid is a sign that you're not an adult, but the sign that you're part of the, like, people who have a vote, like a citizen, not not just like a, a adult. So maybe there's a difference between but those like two. But, like, all the women that I can think of that I've seen have their hair in a yeah. braid. No, yeah. Or maybe, yeah. I, so I'm I'm just confused mm -hmm. about what the women's circle is. Is the women's circle part of the ruling council, or is that a euphemism for the adult women of the village? Like, because we don't hear anything about the women's circle aside from that line. Like, maybe it's just a euphemism for the sisterhood of being women. Like, I I'm so confused. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd love some clarity around that. Um, but and then Bran rushes up like, I thought you were going to die because I don't know anything except that sometimes women die. And Bran's a very weak character. He's very much like the he's the passive behind the scenes character. Marin is clearly the one who like drives the party and right. drives the conversation. And Bran's just kind of like back there. Like, is he even the mayor? He's not wearing like his chain of office thing like do we even have a mayor? Is Marin the mayor? Like, they're they're back seating some of the male figures, I think, to let their female companions step up. We saw the same thing with Isla and Rain. Rain didn't say shit. Yeah, <laughs> uh, totally. And I'm kind of into it. I'm like, this feels so weird. I love having this patriarchy supremacy all up in my head, such that this seems weird to me. I love knowing that I'm programmed. Right. This is and great. it's just like let's just give the women the let's have the women greet people. Let's have them step up first. Let's have them you know greet the person when they come in, and have the men sort of be like, oh yes, I, welcome, as well. Which you know, to be honest is sort of my also lived experience. Is generally when someone walks in, the women are all like, hey, and the guys are in the back going, yo. <laughs> You're not yeah, wrong. So, um, eh, you know, I'm okay with that. And also, one of the things he talks about is how much the Wheel of Time is supposed to be not a matriarchal society, but a society where women have more power and men have to step a little carefully just in case that woman you meet happens to be an Aes Sedai, right? So, there's a certain amount of like trepidation men have around women in the wheel of time that they don't have in the real world because the opposite thing is true that man you meet might just be a violent asshole you know right like and so you sort of have this sort of difference of just default power levels between the two of them um that that has i think meant meant that and i think he's showing that by having the women step forward that's that's the best theory i can come up with as to why he's making those <laughs> sorts of changes um when when directing these these episodes yeah i like it it's it works for yeah. me uh, and then the next thing i have is that i just love that not only do women drink and smoke in this series nynaeve is drinking nynaeve is cheersing with everyone uh, here yeah. and we're part of the group i just i i love that drinking and smoking are generally more normalized for everyone and that nynaeve is not such a stick in the mud spoon up her ass part of the community like she won't dance she doesn't dance at, at winter night but she does drink and i like that yeah look at those braids i don't see anybody without a braid any woman without a braid, you know. Um, great overhead shot. You can sort of get a, an idea of how big the downtown is. <laughs> it's not much more than, yeah. you know, most of the farms are further out. Um, and so, yeah, time has passed. And then this scene that we've all seen. Yeah, and then this scene, which was broken down a little bit. But, yeah, we've gone through this a bunch of times. Um, one thing I noticed, all of our badass characters are introduced with boots first. Tom is. Oh, really? Lan is. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's definitely yeah. a favorite way to introduce like badass characters. It's like check out the boots. The it's boots. all about the boots. 
Yep, just about the boots. Yep. I just the Tuvan throat singing kind of texture. I don't know if it's actually throat singing or if it's some Casio patch. I I haven't listened well enough, but it sounds so cool. <laughs> the music is good. I liked it. I wasn't sure if I would like it when I saw or listened to the soundtrack, but seeing it in context, seeing it used the way it's used with the characters, um, I've just fallen in love. You know, I'm more in love with the in-world yeah. music than I am with the background music, but we'll go into that when we get to it. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm glad I didn't listen to the music until seeing it in context. Hmm. Um, Land's looking very murderal in that shot. He's also got Aragorn in the corner vibes. Yeah. <laughs> That's literally Aragorn in the corner. It's literally that shot. Good shot. Yeah. I mean, paying homage. There's, they're, they're not letting the Lord of the Rings. I'm not complaining. Uh, uh, fall. Because as what RJ did with this right. book. Um, and then we get great Land reveal. Um. And then this is Moraine. I did think that line was awkward. I thought it was awkward in the beginning. I thought it was awkward in this shot as well. I would love... And this whole scene I just found to be less awkward on rewatches. The tension is there. But yeah, I, I, I this was one of the things about episode one that makes me feel like it's just a little clunky was the introduction of Moraine. Yeah, it's very contrived. Mm -hmm. But... Tells the story it does fast. tell the story fast. It sort of basically gives us everything we need to know about how the villagers feel about Aes Sedai and Moraine. It's just very, like, out there. Um, it's effective. They're skipping a little bit. They're condensing. I understand why they're doing it, but it's one of the reasons why I found the other two episodes to flow a lot more smoothly. I find that they're leaning on tropes to save screen time. Sometimes, yeah. And... It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. Get us through the pilot. Get us in. Let's get going. Yeah. If they don't keep it up for a whole season, I'm so okay with it. But it is clunky. I agree. Um, so I'm going to skip past this little bit with the introduction um, to her conversation with Perrin about Layla. Because she's interfering in their marriage because she's wisdom. And that's what she does. But Why? is Perrin. Why is she... Well, okay, I guess the question comes back. Why do you think she's in the Forge and not here celebrating? And why is Nynaeve saying go to her instead of go get her? My first thought is that she suffered a miscarriage a couple of months ago. And she's been withdrawn and isolated and not her normal self ever since. That's my immediate that's how all the pieces fit together best for me. And with how he interacts with her, it's just, to me, that is mm -hmm. clearly what's happening. I'm open to other interpretations, but that's what makes sense to me. So, yeah, it looks to me like she feels like she's betrayed him, and he doesn't feel like it's a betrayal. So he's like, I love you. She's like, I know, and you know, I'm not. Um, and she still loves and him. she still loves him. She's it's not, not saying... that she, she didn't actually betray right, him. Right, right. She feels like she let him down, but not by a... It's not like she cheated right. on him, because then that would be a whole different energy. Right, right. And so... But what I'm wondering if perhaps the loss of the baby had some other... That she was doing something else that caused the loss of the baby that she feels guilty about, or... So there's something that he doesn't know, is all I'm wondering. Um, or mm -hmm. just the general expectation that women are supposed to give babies to men sure. there is a huge amount of cultural context where women feel it's their fault and historically they've often been punished so it could just be that cultural legacy is still here mm -hmm. in this world the way it is in the real world and he's like i don't care because lots of men don't care lots of men don't behead their wives for not giving them sons like it's a perfectly normal response for men to be like it's fine but women can still carry that guilt but maybe yeah she went swimming or ate something or worked iron or made a deal with the dark one i don't know i have a slightly different theory um she is pregnant has not miscarried but the pregnancy was not intended, and they were not married at the time. And they've only gotten married once they discovered she was pregnant. And she doesn't necessarily love him, but had to get married because they got Ooh. pregnant. Oh, a shotgun wedding. It was a shotgun wedding. Kind of thing. Yeah. 
And that's and that's and so the whole hand on the baby thing is yes, she is pregnant. Yes, he loves her. She doesn't necessarily love him, and he knows that. But he's there to support her and protect her and make sure that she and the baby are raised correctly. That ties it together really, really well. And then the whole guilt over killing the baby that she didn't really want, and uh, like. And it's another reason why I think that it's a pregnancy thing is because he hits her in the abdomen. Yes, absolutely. And that cannot be an accident. And which which gives <laughs> I mean, us it is a little an axe. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Shut up. Um, also, that just made me realize that if we're right about this, this means that we had a red wedding moment in like the first episode of our show. So fuck you, Game of Thrones stands. <laughs> No, some some of you are fine. Some of you are assholes, but some of you are fine. I'm gonna have to stop this edit this so hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, that's my working because I'm like the the miscarriage doesn't fully fit to me. But yeah. her being resentful of getting married maybe before she went through the women's circle. No, she's got the scar in her arm. Mm, oh. Hmm. Is that- yeah, she's the person who made me wonder if the scarring is part of the overall ceremony rather than just an accident of Egwene's experience. Because gotcha. she ha- she has many burns and scars on her arms because she's a blacksmith. Right, I assume that was a blacksmithing thing, not a ceremony it, thing. It happens to look exactly like the one Egwene's got, so... Mm. Hmm. Um, but, and I'm not saying that, like, Perrin deliberately, like, hit her in the stomach or anything ridiculous. I, I just, the visual impact of that is, like, it's, this has to be a pregnancy-related issue in their marriage. Right. Whether it's she hasn't been able to hold a pregnancy or they got drunk and fooled around and now they're married, whatever it is, it's something to do with pregnancy, like the body language and everything. It's just, and I, I can totally see it being that she, she is pregnant. Nice. I could see that. So sure, where's that scar? Also, she's hot as oh, fuck. Oh yeah, absolutely. The muscles. That. And oh, the amount of earrings. The, the, the earrings are definitely the most memorable part. The muscles as well, and the shoulders. Uh. Just, yeah. <laughs> Notice how her like her jerkin has the same sort of attachment that Perrin's does here over the shoulder. It's got that like mm-hmm. metal vest attachment. Yeah. Right. That to me is not a miscarriage bear belly. That is a currently pregnant belly. Yeah, well, it could be that she's miscarried several times in their marriage already, and there's a lot of fear around she's going to lose this one, and she feels she has to do it, and, like, there's a lot of ways that miscarriage could still fit into her being pregnant currently. I really want to get backstory. I don't want this to all be speculation. And then she does lean back on him, so it's like... But he's security, not necessarily... Yeah, uh, uh, that... And and I... there's a lot that could that could mean a lot, right? Like we need. And context. I wonder, like, yeah, and like I wonder, like, what's up with like you didn't even go to her ceremony? Like, is Egwene somehow involved in why Lila has this tragic backstory that we don't know yet? Like, I just I need context. <laughs> yeah, it's so interesting. Um, yeah, but yeah. Big, hot, lesbian, blacksmith vibes. Yeah, definitely. For sure. Which, I mean, maybe she was the one crushing on Egwene. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Maybe. And the pregnancy that caused her to marry Perrin forced that to end, and she's like, I, yeah, who knows? Who knows? If we don't get backstory, like, that's not going to end well. <laughs> so Perrin shows up, and we get the other big backstory change. And honestly, I think that's part of the reason why it was so hard to hit, is we got these two backstory changes. Boom, boom, one right after the other. Yeah. And those are the two biggies, right? Perrin has a wife, and I mean, the fridging. And then, you know, Matt's parents are not great. Dysfunctional, Dysfunctional. and unhappy. Um, and Also, mm-hmm. did it seem like the girls are not Matt's full siblings? Do I just not know how children are supposed to work? Because they seemed like they don't look like they're related to him at all. I, yeah, that's because she says you're going to be just like your father. So they're both his parents are his parents. And if they're both still around, how would these children? I mean, I guess if the mother cheated, but like they. That's what I'm thinking yeah. is that she cheated one time and now he just flirts with anything in a skirt. And there's I'm guessing there's layers on layers. Sure. And I'm just wondering if the twins, but they look like twins yeah. are 
are the mm -hmm. result of the one time she cheated. I don't know. I don't know how children work. Casting is complicated. I would think. I actually don't necessarily think they're twins. I think one. This one in the front is younger than the one in the back, who's a year or two oh, okay. older. Um, and I think that they're all related to Matt. I think they're all his sisters. They do, however, they do, however, light a candle on the ceremony to bring back someone from the dead. Um, so there's some wondering if maybe there's a middle sister or middle child that was between, because there is a big age gap, that between them, um, there was somebody who did end up dying. So I've seen speculation about that. It would, it, and that's the kind of thing that could drive a couple apart. That's a classic thing that drives a couple apart in stories like this is the lo a tragic loss of a child. And yeah, I was like the fact that they all light a candle is like who died. So yeah, I could, that would plug the age gap. That makes a lot of sense. Which does mean that he doesn't have a sister going to the White Tower in the course of the series. Well, which, uh, That's been eliminated. Clearly, there isn't one of the right age. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but taking care of a drunk parent. Taking care of a... that It's so it's heartbreaking. Hard, yeah. It's a... It's a really rough, like, that's a lived experience for a lot of people. And It was for my mother. I know she, she did this for her mother. Like, Same. Yeah. My mom had to do this for her mom. So It's like, we, we speak from experience yeah. when we say we know this is hard. And it seemed, from my, you know, generationally distant perspective, this is um, a pretty sympathetic take on it. Like, this just sucks. Our, this isn't a moral failing. This is just yeah. a shitty situation. Well, in our grandparents' generation, there were a lot of housewives who were very bored and turned to alcoholism. And, like, that was became a thing that a lot of people of that generation suffered from. Um, or suffered a loss, suffer a loss and yeah. turned to alcoholism. And because back then it wasn't really considered a disease. Drinking during the day was fine no. and normalized, right? So... Yeah, that's why I think like drinking as a way to cope yeah. was like culture. I think our grandparents' generation really did suffer from just way more alcoholism than we realized. Also, they didn't have any other drugs, which we do. Tours <laughs> 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 back. Um, so yeah, that sucks. More about. I also like that it gives us a little more reason for Matt to be complicated. Yep. And to be such a, a class clown on the outside and all that, like you have, it, his backstory has always been remarkably bland for the personality traits he has. Sure. So this honestly makes him make more sense. Also, I think it explains a lot about his relationship with Oliver later. Oh yes. So assuming that they don't cut him, which they better not. No, yeah, no, no. He's very important. But he can. But sounder. he's like fifth season character. Oh, yeah, he probably hasn't even, the actor probably hasn't even been born yeah. yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's probably been born. Yeah. He's probably very young. This scene, there's a lot of cool stuff in this scene. Because um, this is them cleaning up afterwards. Yep. And her basically saying, you two need to talk, get together and finish up cleaning, and also go ahead and bang it out while you're at it. Yeah, the parents are all just like, clearly there's some tension you need to release. We're going to go. <laughs> <laughs> I love that they're all just like, clearly you two need some alone time. <laughs> well, because they've all watched them not talk all night, right? Like, mm -hmm. everybody's watching All the way. parents are in the corner, like, yeah. they're not talking, they're not talking. They're not talking about what's going on, you know? <laughs> so, like, something needs to happen here, clearly. Um, and they do talk... She tries to tell him about Nynaeve, but then he seduces her with the um, strawberry. Yeah, the kissing and the strawberry. Mm -hmm. This this whole sequence is beautiful and heartbreaking yeah. all at once because he knows in this scene that she what well, she's chosen. Not like yet. As soon as she says, you no, know, he does. You watch the body language. He knows because he says later that he knows. I don't because she she doesn't he doesn't know yet that she's been asked. Yeah, I okay. Hear me out. Yeah, he says, "How was the ceremony? Was it good or bad?" Yeah, and when she says "good," he's disappointed. Mm. He knows that he's losing her, which is when she goes to start telling him about stuff. He's like, "Nope, I need a good bye fuck. Mm. We need to we we I need one more time before you tell me before everything changes." Um, like, I, I see it completely differently. I don't think he has an mm. idea until he because not until Nynaeve says. No, he doesn't know what she's going to leave him for, yeah. but he can tell that she's. Mm -hmm. This is the beginning of her drifting away. Maybe, maybe. Yes. Yes. I, I, yeah. <laughs> 
I, both everyone in chat is wrong. <laughs> chat is agreeing with me, not you. So, huh? Um, uh, yeah, I think he's. Still... I'm having a really hard time keeping up with chat, but yeah. I can tell you all you were wrong right now. Uh, I think he's completely oblivious until later, because Rand being oblivious is always a safe bet. That that is a fair argument. <laughs> um, I love the way this is going to set up their conflict later. Like having them be truly in love, truly together, truly thinking they're going to be a couple as opposed to just being promised. Let's And having yeah. physical intimacy rather than the tension of unresolved right. physical intimacy makes the relationship way mm -hmm. more believable. Like they're really into each other. It's not just like someday. And, and I like Rafe saying when he, Rafe says, oh, I aged them up. I always thought, okay, so they're older, but they're in the same circumstances. But when he says I aged them up, he's like, okay, what happens if they actually spent two more years in the two rivers? What would have happened? Yes. And that's where he says, exactly. Perrin talks about marrying Layla. He would have gotten married. He would have married Layla. He was talking about marrying her. So that's how, where he pulled that from. Rand and Gwen, who were promised, would have started getting it on. You know, um, Matt, not so much changing his way forward, as so much changing his entire backstory. So... With the way his but it, he can't be married because, yeah. it, like, it just it doesn't. He's super poor. Yeah, yeah. His whole backstory sets him up differently. But yeah, I I love that that like Lila isn't made up out of whole cloth. She's literally who he was going to marry. Mm -hmm. Like that was going to happen. <laughs> I guess she's not getting fat yeah. and having lots of babies with that other guy now. <laughs> nope. Uh, that is funny though. They, they, she was definitely a plump girl when he came home, and that is not yeah. who she <laughs> showed her badass as hell. But I, this this was great. I think everybody. I think this was wonderful to finally see them together. Like it. Oh, it was so, it was sweet. Sweet, so sweet. Even though we know it's and their chemistry sweet. is so good. Oh, great! Like the acting is amazing the strawberry thing adorable like and the lighting the lighting in all of this is just spectacular renaissance painting right yes yes that's that's it that's okay i'm going nuts here because that's the aesthetic everyone's like it's too clean it's too clean i'm like but it's rent and everyone's like well it's a renaissance period i'm like it's not really a renaissance period but it's a renaissance painting I love that. Yeah. That's the aesthetic. Like, no, we're not doing grim dark. We're doing Renaissance. We don't need to do yeah. medieval painting anymore. We're doing Renaissance painting. We're painting a Renaissance picture on the screen. And yes, that involves two clean clothes and bright colors occasionally splash across warm lights and great skin color. Like, fuck, it's beautiful. And I'm so yeah, happy to get right? away. Like, I hated The Witcher because it was like, oh, gray on gray. On. Like, let's just make it a black and white. Yeah. Like, why are we even including this as a color? Like, let's go black and white and stylize it, right? Like, yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. And the other aspect of aging them up is that they're more sexually active because guess what happens by the time most people have turned 20? You know? Deep rooting the two rivers makes it more believable. Down with that. Also, I like that she's the same age as the other three. Yeah. They don't need to make her younger. Yeah. Though it does surprise me that she's only just now starting to apprentice with Nynaeve if she's 20. You'd think that that training would have started when she was like 15. But I'm wondering if they're slide. also, he might age up the age at, with mo at which most people start channeling. Although the, the, her, the Nynaeve's master wisdom uh was 13 yep. when she started mentor mentor when she first started channel so it just maybe it varies quite a bit i mean again it's a analog for menstruating for the first time mm -hmm. right so as young right. as 13 as old as 20 20's kind of yeah. old yeah 20's kind of old 20's pretty old yeah <laughs> and 13's pretty young unless you're drinking a bunch of milk with a bunch of hormones and blah 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 scare tactics okay never mind moving on <sighs> sorry a raging hippie just came out for a sec. Yeah. <laughs> so Rand gives her the straw, smallest strawberry ever, and she says, "Gross, that's been in your pocket all day," which I thought was a great <laughs> laugh line. So cute. Um, and she says, "I'll just go ahead and kiss you anyway." Uh, and then, ooh, we get land butt, land butt, <laughs> we man get butt. Her not looking away from his regions as he gets into the cold water. At this point, <laughs> he gets into it like it's cold. <laughs> I think it's warm. I think it's warm. It's just not. I know, yeah. but his body language is like, yeah. he's like a cat. He's just got this like wrinkled cat face. Like, mm, it's not warm enough. <laughs> but yeah, land butt, Moraine already in the water, completely covered. Just a delight. 
I'm just going to leave the man butt up there for a while, if you don't mind. Yeah, no, yeah, for sure. <laughs> so when when Brandon and I were watching this, he didn't get the impression that these two weren't fucking from this scene. He thought that this entire sequence uh, enforced that they were fucking. I'm like, no, no. The part where she didn't caress him with the heat, like, obviously they're not fucking. And he... Did not agree with me about that being obvious, but hopefully he's in the minority. I think your husband is in the minority in seeing things like that. I, there's a certain... Anyway, moving on. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. But I, think um, the, I love... Yeah. I think it does convey the, the... What's the word I'm looking for? Platonic? Platonic nature of the relationship. I really do think it does. Just like there's one yeah. bath. Like there's only... There's, we just... We're going to both take it. Yeah. And she, he doesn't sit down next to her. There's no arm over the shoulder. There's no foot in the lap. There's not like there's lots of other things that would would indicate that this was a relationship. Yeah. And also a cool thing about this is we see her doing the motions to heat the water up without seeing the weaves. Yes. Because, of course, Lan can't see the weaves. Right. He can anticipate them, but he can't see them. But it could be warmer. <laughs> he says, I'm just a little disappointed. <laughs> yeah, so here uh, is the weaves, right? Yeah. We see yeah. steam coming up, which looks very yeah. vaguely weave-like. We see the effects, and, and then there's a sound effect to let us know that it's happening, mm -hmm. even though I'm sure it doesn't actually make a sound. And then, then the hot tub arms. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they, ooh, I actually need some cooling going on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Love that. I like also that he cares about physical comfort when it's allowed. Yeah, yeah, he doesn't have to be hard. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then postcoital with Ran. I, I love also that like we flash to a platonic naked scene while Rand and Egwene are getting it on, and then we flash back to them postcoital. This, this is a very this is a great symmetry there. Um, yeah, I, and everyone called this as post sex and. Shockingly, yes. Yes, it is. Yeah. We were right, we were, because we're adults. I really thought it was Faldara. <laughs> I was wrong about that. Yeah, we were very debating yeah. where this was. You were was, like, no, it's no, clearly... it's the end. It's still got the windows. I was like, that doesn't make any sense. But I didn't realize just how intimate they were in the beginning. Um, Which was a yeah. fair question. Yeah. We didn't know. Uh, some brand shirt off. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure we'll get more shots of that as the season goes on. We'd better. Um, I love the lighting in this shot. Yeah, th this was the one that was really just blowing my mind with the color composition across their faces. Just, and it's the whole series so far, but this scene just captures what's amazing about that whole quality. Um, so she tells him about Nynaeve. He gets upset and storms off, and then she's left. And it's an interesting timeline thing here. So he says, I'm going to go home. He stomps out into a pouring down rainstorm and somehow doesn't meet the fade. The next morning, when Egwene comes out, his dad is there. Tam is there in the village and says he left before I woke up. Mm. So it's like there's a place where like they were actually staying in town overnight. And like Tam stayed in the village overnight. I assumed he stayed in the inn. Why wouldn't they stay in the inn? Oh, in the yeah, inn. Upstairs. Of course. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Catherine Kay says he thinks he had to go to bed, not home. Let's see. All right, she's going to bed. Go home to bed. I, I, go I, I think he said bed? go up to bed. Oh, uh, okay. So let's... Um, a few other things about this yeah. scene. Why are Wisdoms banned from being married? That's made it more ironclad than it was in the books. Yes. And I, I don't appreciate that. I mean, I get it for a world building perspective, but I don't like it. And I also love that they change instead of trying to use the word children, like that's a normal fucking word, which is stupid and old. They just said kids. Mm. It The real world swears and the modernizing of some little bits of language, mom, dad and kids instead of mother, father, children. I like it. It, it makes it easier for me to immerse myself in the fantasy with them not using like old styles of speaking and i feel like that takes away some of the campiness yeah that, like being in a medieval yeah. world inevitably creates right like because the last thing i want to do is have this feel like a bunch of cosplayers hanging around cosplaying these characters mm -hmm. um and they've effectively yeah. made it that that was something that i was that i'm always worried about that that to me is what the legend of the seeker feels like is like a bunch of people cosplaying the characters um and the, I, I don't get that feeling from these books from these shows the show at yeah all. and i 
that's honestly part of why I'm glad that there's real world swears in it is because I feel like they wouldn't be able to pull off the in world swears believably. I disagree. I'm Cause... I'm on pro in world swears. I think Frack worked great for Farscape for um Battle Star Galactica. Galactica. I think that um cursing is a way for fans to identify that they like the show. But I, I've had this debate a million times and there's definitely people who think that, that fake cursing sounds fake and fine. I, I like it. I like I like adapting my cursing. I think cursing sounds like cursing no matter. I think you can say freaking, fucking, um, you know, fridge, whatever you want to call it. But I think it all sounds the same in my head. So I like in words. Uh, I don't like it when fantasy takes out shit. I feel like that's just too obvious. Oh, of a curse. sure. Sure. So I'm enjoying having that included. Yeah. Um, it would be nice to get some of the in-world swears as the world opens up and expands. That that would be very pleasant. It's just, I like having shit and bastard in there. These sure. are really normal yeah, words. Those, are, those like, are fine words. They exist yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Don't pretend that you can sanitize them out by saying nincompoop or whatever. Totally. Oh, that was a bad reference. <laughs> but no, I agree with you there. I just want to also get the in-world. I want blood and bloody ashes. I want Matt to say yeah. blood and bloody ashes, right? I want Mother's Milk in a Cup. I want a gl- Elaine to, like, collect a couple of really dumb, awkward curses and say them poorly, right? Like, Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. That's the- and we've had light a couple of times, so there's hope. Okay, sweet, sweet. Let's move to the next scene of the murder draw. Okay. Ah, ah. And the whistle. Yeah, that. That. I was like, that. <laughs> I was like, that. all right, I'll just listen for the whistle and then the cut. <laughs> and then the cut to, and then the cut to fame. <laughs> Great <laughs> cut. Great dude. cut. So, <gasps> He's well, whistling that no. same tune. Uh, uh, uh. And so listen for that whistle. Like that noise that he creates yeah. is like, oh, that's a feign, murdral, um, maybe even uh, more death whistle. So that's an I two. imagine that that musical theme is yeah. going to persist throughout the entire series. Yeah. Um, and I can't say enough positive about this actor as Fane. Oh god. Like he's amazing. He's amazing. The laugh, <laughs> the grin, like. Yeah, the full, all, all the, teeth, the teeth, the yeah. eyes crinkled, and yet the very first shot of him is him whistling the evil yeah. song. So there's no, no question that he's a bad guy, and then they give you further shots to inform that he's a, a bad guy. And this weird but... upward shot that gives you an odd angle, like, yeah, it's definitely this he's... man is, is evil. Oh, this is amazing. Um, so really love that. We talked about this shot that Rand left already mm-hmm. in the night. She's looking for him. Yep. Um, and there's then the scar. She's awake. Yeah, that's the shot with the scar. Yeah. And it looks exactly like, well, I guess Egwene's is on her other arm. And I see I, I, I see one on the wrist. I, I see one on the underside. I see one. I think these are just blacksmithing scars. I think that's all, all they're right. trying to show, to be honest. Chat, what do you think? But it's interesting that she's still awake and, you know, playing with his hand. Like, she's thinking about something and trying to reconcile to something. I don't know. I'm just... And this song. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know... Did you ever listen to uh, the soundtrack for The Wheel of Time? The album that came out oh, yeah. like a long ass time ago? It wasn't my style of music. I never really got into it. Yeah. Oh, no, no. It's awful. <laughs> I mean, I love it. I love it. It, It's it's like a Disney movie soundtrack. Where it, it's yeah. fine. I listen to it occasionally because um, it just gives me feel. It's like it is the musical equivalent of the Daryl K. Sweet covers. Sure. There's a nostalgia yeah. factor. Yeah, yeah. There is a song in it called the wine spring reel that sounds vaguely like- remarkably like this it's there's a couple of pieces throughout here where it's just like are it was that an omit was that an omit or am i just making shit mm-hmm. up i don't know i think it might, might be um, more pulling from similar sources to reference similar things yeah like i don't am i am i making this up like i don't know but um you know mm-hmm. It's a question that I have. So Matt tries to sell the bracelet to Fane. Fane correctly identifies it as stolen. I think it is real gold, though. Oh, I'm sure he's lying about it being real gold, because, well... He stole I think Fane's like, no, it's fake. And he's like, no, it's real. And he's like, but can I sell it here? Yeah. But Matt clearly can't tell the difference, because he doesn't push. Oh, dear. 
<laughs> Mas- yeah, it is. Yeah, but he doesn't push that hard. No. Um, because I don't think he knows. Well, gold's not hard to tell the difference no. with. Um, I think Fane's just the line. I think he's just like not real gold, and, and he's like, "Yes, it is." What are you trying to pull? Like, I don't don't pull a fast one out over on me. Uh-huh. Right, but then Fane's like, "Well, I can't sell it in this town, so therefore I have therefore dirt I know on it's you stolen, because, yeah. yeah, yeah." And this is yeah. definitely the first time he's fenced stolen stuff. What yep. you have for me this year? Yep. Yeah. yeah, and he's a right bastard. That's just in case you missed the whistling clue. He's fucking over one of our heroes, so clearly he's a bastard. <laughs> um, love the parallels between them, the long coats, the way that they mirror each other with hairstyle, with beard. Um, there's just, there's a very much like the two of them standing side by side. Sorry about the flicking through things. I'm trying to get, there's one shot of them side by side from a distance that I really liked. Yeah. They are dressed very similarly. Just like wealthy and poor versions of the same person. Mm-hmm. I can't wait to see him get the dagger instead, uh-huh. you rat bastard. <laughs> I want to see him go fucking dagger nuts and become more dead. That's <laughs> that's gonna be cool. Yeah, that's the one that I wish uh, I would love more of him because he is just take blown away. Um, I bet we get a lot more of him in the Sean Chan mm-hmm. arc. So here we get the statement that. There's a fade in the town already, and we both have work to do. Now, her work is finding the Dragon Reborn. What's his? Finding the... the Well, he finds the Dragon's Fang of Slaughtered Sheep. That's right. He His his job is to go out and scout and see what the forces of darkness are that are out there. Gotcha. Um, but I thought... Oh, yes, yeah, he hasn't done that yet. Yeah, yeah, no, that's... He didn't sleep because he feels like they're out there, and she's like, well, then go reconnaissance. Yep. Get me actual information. And then he comes back in the night and is like, we need to dip right now. And she's like, well, we need to kidnap some people first, which may involve saving the town, mm. kind of, sort of, sorry. Mm. Mm. Strap in, we're going for a ride. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely if you give him a, a cookie kind of rescue mm-hmm. effort. Um, and then we get this... Rand broods on a hilltop. Oh, just... Gorgeous scenery. Yes, Rand is brooding. Uh, you know, this is this has very much um, beginning of book three vibes to me, where he goes up in the mountain and broods mm-hmm. right before he flees. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And he's like, I need to prove that I'm the Dragon Reborn. I need to be by myself, right? There's a certain isolation. Like, we already get that with Rand. He's isolating himself here. He isolates himself later when he's sleeping by the cave, right? Like, Rand, mm-hmm. when he deals with shit, isolates himself. I love. He goes somewhere very stony and hard and <laughs> cold and <laughs> uh, on a mountain. Right, yeah. yeah, yeah. This is yeah. this is. I mean, foreshadowing Dragon Mount right here, uh, like veins of gold right here. Like, it's foreshadowing yeah. everything uh, about uh, his mental yeah, health arc. Absolutely. Uh, and then Egwene comes in with the costume that everybody needs to cosplay because please. The uh, the hand embroidery around the on the shirt is a nice touch. Oh God, it's so good. Okay, first of all, I'm annoyed at him that he Han Soloed her. Where she goes to say something, to confess something, and he's like, I know. And it's like, shut up and let the woman fucking have her line. Yeah. yeah. It's so Han Solo, it annoys me. Um, but I love that once it's been said, he goes to comfort her yeah. because it's like, it is this big, momentous, like, transitional thing for her. Like, she's she's going to have regrets about it either way. See, right? I, uh, sorry, I got I got to go back to that Han Solo. I got to go Layla Han Solo Perrin before this, right? This was just an interruption. Han Solo didn't interrupt her. He just responded to her emotional outpouring with a bland, I know, right? Oh, you're right. The interruption, you're right. he didn't interrupt her at all. Like Clearly, Star Wars is not my favorite <laughs> fandom. <laughs> but, but Layla definitely did that to Perrin, where he's like, I love you. And she goes, yeah, I know. <laughs> but that was not a big, huge confession. That was him saying something for the billionth sure. time. Yeah. This is, but you're you are right about about that. Um. So that I just don't want the Star Wars fans to he... yell at me. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine, fine. I'll take the Star Wars fans hate. Whatever. Um, but yeah, he he doesn't let her have the emotional moment. He's like, yeah, I know you're leaving me. Like. Clearly, you're, you're going to choose your ambition over me. Like, I knew that from the beginning. I know you. I love you. There's no doubt in my mind that that's what you were going to choose. Right? Like, right. And that's like, you don't have a choice, really. Yeah. And she's the one, she's has to come to terms with it for herself, right. not with respect to him. And 
but yeah, she she suffers a loss from making that choice, mm-hmm. not holding it, it, both options open, and and he comforts her over it, and it's just so sweet. My heart. Until he later becomes a butt about it, but that's a whole other. Well, you know. but then that hurts my heart in a different way. Yeah. Twists the knife at a different angle. <laughs> uh, and that's also only when he's, she's going to study with Nynaeve, not trusting Moraine. Yeah. So anyhow. So um, here she's cleaning off what appears to be all the colors from the pool from the earlier ceremony. Because th- we're going to have flashbacks. I'm I'm getting that. Yeah. 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 Um, and this is the you're too young. I'm going to ignore you as wisdom scene that we get in Eye of the World. Just rephrased. Um, Moraine deliberately insults Nynaeve to get her age. Yeah. And that's something we yeah. saw in the very first confrontation when they first meet in the books. But here it gets delayed a little bit to the special pool. But that like, well, you've had that braid for one, maybe two years. And she's yeah, like, that's five or six. Bar. Yeah, that's a barb. That's <laughs> yeah. absolutely a barb. Yeah, it's or perceived it's as a very anyway. interesting. Yeah, it's a very interesting conversation because Moraine does a lot of stuff to deliberately antagonize Nene. Like several different yeah. things to insult her, belittle her. Uh not let her get out of the pool and stand taller than her. Like, there's just all this body language. Just de- very Deus de yeah. Mar stuff. Calls her cleaning lady, basically. Like, oh, you're important. I didn't know and you I were don't cleaning think that lady. That's, yeah, and I don't think that that's actually Moraine's natural inclination. I think she's doing oh, all yeah. of that deliberately. That's I think every single piece of that is calculated. Absolutely calculated. Boom, calculated. Right? Like, to eliminate or confirm Nynaeve's place of birth or and or age. Right, that's the entire yeah. what she's getting at the entire time. Oh, you weren't born here. That makes you a possible dragon reborn. How old are you exactly? I can't find out because there's no records. I've already checked. Trust me. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. And then I have I have a question, which is, do we believe Nynaeve's story about her mentor's experience with the White Tower? Is that what happened? Obvi- I, mean, I don't think she's lying. Right, right, right. But do we believe that that's what actually happened? Not in a million years. Oh. Yeah. Okay. No, cool. not cool, in a million cool, years. Cool, cool. So I'm like, people are like, oh my God, the White Tower, that's a total big change. And I'm like, it's an only big change if Nynaeve's right. And we've got a secondhand experience from 50 years ago, maybe. And Moraine has shown no problem with oh, these are village girls, so I don't want them to learn to channel or I don't want to recruit them, right? Like, maybe, maybe the White Tower has become classist. That's entirely possible. We'd have to change Suan's backstory. Fine. But, like, I don't think that's what's happening. I think that we're getting an unreliable narrator here. That that something different happened with her. Either that she wasn't willing to take the test or... You know, or maybe a dark friend rejected it or something like that. But Nynaeve certainly believes it, right? Like, I don't doubt that. Um, but I've seen no evidence that the White Tower has that policy of turning away young women just because they're poor. Yeah, it makes no sense no. with the canonical evidence. There's no reason to change it. It makes so much sense that they rejected her because she was a wilder. She was too young. She was too weak. She wouldn't agree to their rules. She got entangled with a situation and got turned away. She never actually made it to the tower and told Nynaeve something else. Like Someone turned her away who didn't have the authority to do so because they were a dark friend, right? Like Totally. Yeah. Something else happened. I, I don't believe it either. It makes no mm. sense for them to make the White Tower a elitist organization in, in that way. For all that they are an ivory tower, classism makes no no narrative sense for them to add. And, and especially in episode one on my rewatches, I'm looking for unreliable narrators. I'm looking for context that makes a scene uh, viewed differently when you actually know what's going on around it. Like, I like uh, the way he has set this up, it feels a little incomplete, and I think that's deliberately so he can change context. When I say he, I'm meaning Rafe. He can change context about so we can go back and see those scenes again a lot of these scenes again after seeing the season one and go, oh, that's what was going on. We didn't know that. Because in the that's what we do. Yeah, because that's what we do. You know, <laughs> so like that's the very spoilers way of looking at things. And and so I really do hope that when we go back and, and view this episode um, in the beginning, we're like, that's very odd. All these things that we're like, ah, we want more explanation. I hope by the end of the season, we're like, whoa, that was cool. You know, so. Mm-hmm. 
But I, 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 yeah. I gave you my theories of flashbacks up front. Like, I think we've got a, a, a major flashback to at least Winter Night from each of these characters that's going to give us more context. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Having already seen Nynaeve's. Yeah. Um, so we talked a lot about this as she scrubs. A lot of dialogue, dialogue, flashback. I love their interaction, yeah. honestly. It's just, it, it sets up why Nynaeve has antagonism towards Aes Sedai in general and Morin in particular. Right. Like, right. that sets up a lot of angst, which is good. Um, three boys. I want that sweater, by the way. I've. So much. Never as a knitter, and I've told her she needs to get started on making me a copy <laughs> of that sweater. So. Nice, nice. With real wool. Definitely. So, that conversation is Rand saying that, that Egwene broke up with him. Yeah without actually saying a word. Yeah. This is, the boys can't talk to girls, but they can talk to each other about girls with virtually no actual words, <laughs> which yeah. is well, on point. On point. <laughs> um, and this. Listening to the scene. wind, yes. So I have a theory about what they're hearing. Yeah, please. They're hearing the sheep being butchered. Mm. And it's happening way up the hill, and the wind is carrying the sound down, and it's all wound through rock formation, or, you know, rocks and trees and all of that. But there's screaming in it. It's I think it's Trolloc screaming. I think it's the sheep screaming, yeah. and that's just my theory. Um, it sounds like Souls of the Damned. It doesn't sound like aggression. Mm -hmm. And then, then almost the next thing we see is the sheep that were, you know, ritualistically mutilated and killed, which I, it, it was clearly a fade who did that. And fades enjoy causing pain. Can I come up with a different theory here? I don't think it's an no. audible sound they're hearing. I think listening to the wind is not, you don't stand there and actually listen to the wind blowing by you. You're embracing the power and you're using that to sense the pattern. No, no, I, I totally get that. And that was where I started with this scene. But then I was listening into it and hearing the screams and noticing the sheep. And I'm like, are, are there layers happening here? Because we have an army of the damned coming to kill everyone. So it makes sense for them to be screaming in the mystic sense. But are there actual screams also? I but no, I mean, I completely agree. Listening to the wind is a meditative process of sensing what's going on. And that's definitely what she's being trained in. I just, my, my pseudo, not pseudo, my kind of loony theory is that it's the sheep being eviscerated at the same time. That might be when they're being, well, I think they've been eviscerated last night. And it's only because land finds them during the day. And so I think they were eviscerated during the night by the Trollocs. So I think the Trollocs go to yeah. ground during the day. That would make sense. It could still be the sheep in the their ghost form. Ghost sheep. Damned ghost sheep souls. Let me count them really quick. Okay. One, two. <laughs> uh, uh. All right. So moving past listening to the wind, um, we find that is the next shot. So I can see where you make that connection. And what looks like a very perfect dragon's fang. Or may maybe it's that the evil energy raised by that act is making nasty shit on the wind for them to sense. Right. And right. so they used screaming fully to create that sense of menace because it's an impression that's happening. And yeah, it's a perfect dragon's fan. This looks like ritualistic. This is like a in-world satanic ritual. I think it's interesting know? to outline the other side. They actually use the trees here. Like they anchor it pretty good. Tree there and tree there. Right, both those trees oh, yeah, are the outside do. of the other side of the circle. They do, and there's almost a footpath defining yep. the curve. Very, very much is. Yeah. yeah, yeah. This is the whole symbol. And this is another. They're trying to give oh. Matt the cash. They do give Matt. And then he cash. takes it. Yeah. And and his voice is all tight when he says thank you. Like it's just. The camaraderie and chemistry happening between the three boys is really getting into my heartstrings, and I love it. It's kind of funny, though. Matt gambled with them and lost his money to them. So in a lot of ways, it's like, oh, yeah, Matt lost all his money, and they're giving him his own money back. But at the same time, it's like Matt gets to gamble for free. If he loses his money, he gets it back. <laughs> it's because his friends are good to him. And it's, they're doing it for his sisters. That's the only reason he accepts right. is for his sisters. And they give it to him for lanterns. It's clearly more money than he needs for lanterns because... Pat and Fane gave him the lanterns, gave him the lanterns for half a mark, and they're giving him three, it looks like. 
Um, so it's, you know, but it's for the girls. Yeah. Good friends. Mm. Yeah. And Maureen watches and the so, whole thing from the window. So, so, yeah. The window. Flames in the window. Yeah. You've seen them, right? Yeah. Where? Yeah. Look at the right to her stage left from her face. Look at those teardrop fang mm. things in the in the stained glass. No, oh, yeah. There's four four teardrop fangy things right next to her. Yeah, I can see that. Right there. Yeah, this, this, I, I like that stained glass. So any circular stained glass window wins me over almost immediately. Oh yeah, no, the windows are in general amazing. But I was like, I wonder if there's anything in the stained glass, and yes, yes, there is something in the stained glass. <laughs> <laughs> The shots of the Rip Mountains are just oh gorgeous. Uh, Slovenia, why you gotta do this to me? Um, so then we get the explanation about the lighting of the candles and how that which is so sweet. Uh, that is, and that's a change. It, but it does give us information about reincarnation and the wheel that we didn't have this early in the books. This is a good way to give us some exposition while talking about his wife and Carrie Althor and and the dead, and it changes the meaning of uh, this holiday. It does, but it gives us such valuable world building and it lets him give us that line about like why we can't <clears throat> why we can't remember our pre previous lives. Yeah. We must oh, it, that's important. So important. The foreshadowing there. Oh my god. And then the whole like <clears throat> I saw this from the Twitter of time, one of the Twitter of time accounts, like the official Amazon one, one of them uh, said something about how like Tam, like you get reborn in cycles and maybe you've seen this particular actor delivering the line in another life and, and they're doing better this time. And it was just a total little like nod to his Game of Thrones role. Just like <laughs> he's being a better dad this time because he's been reborn. That's that's what's happening. That's, <laughs> that's how clever. you can canonically make this make sense. That's clever. But yeah, I mean, telling us everything about that, that his father is the one who tells him it would be a terrible thing to remember your prior mistakes. Yeah. Knowing that it's Rand right. who is going to have to experience LTT's trauma. The man who can't forget. I mean, I, the Tom song referencing the Dragon Reborn is so good. I definitely want to talk about that at some, when we get to it. But um, yeah. yeah, it's such yeah. a good song. The, the, again, the music is blowing me away. Um, matches. I didn't notice that matches. Look, they have matches. Look at that. That is matches. I heard it. I don't think I could see it because yeah, your dumb head is in the way. It's at, well, sorry, yeah. it's at, it was also below the line, <laughs> I think, of the, the thing. Oh, okay. But, yeah. but I heard it. I, that was a distinctly matches. That was distinctly matches. So Aludra is going to have to invent something else. Or they're doing away with Aludra. They're definitely doing away with Aludra. God damn it. I mean, we haven't seen fireworks yet. There's no fire, true. so we don't know anything. That might be an unknown at this point. Like gunpowder might be more of an invention for Ludra. Okay, I could. All right. But but then yeah, we get the sulfur. You know, that's one of those things that people have said matches weren't invented until the 1800s. Like getting the right balance of sulfur so they actually strike right is much more difficult than coming up with black powder. So yeah but again this is post-apocalypse not medieval right. so but that that is a significant change that people noticed was the matches mm -hmm. uh -huh. yeah and then this ceremony suggests that everyone in the village has lost someone already and they've all got backstories and i'm so curious who most of them are actually mourning i'm guessing a lot of that's just grandparents like ancestors mm. eventually die and you m maintain no everyone lives forever <laughs> uh, no that that's yeah. fair and i mean with naive obviously we know it's her parents right. like clearly that's why she's doing it alone so she can like cry and have her thing with no one seeing her um but yeah i mean with matt's family it's like probably a middle sibling Egwene, i guess yeah it's probably grandparents yeah we, we don't know anyone, whether there's somebody in her family that she's missing we also don't see any of her siblings so that's true yeah the mom makes me think it's very much Mm -hmm. A middle sibling, and the way he's hugging those two. Yeah. You know, the parent and. And she, Lila came to this one, which supports my idea that they've maybe miscarried once at least. Mm. 
or I mean, there lots of family members, but Lila came to this one, so maybe it's just because it's a less social event. No, she comes to the whole thing. She comes to the whole to the whole winter night thing. So I don't know. She's just in a better mood, I guess. There's not need doing it by herself. Being watched. She doesn't want anyone to see her cry. <laughs> and Moraine's watching her, of course. Or, Moraine's watching. Sorry, not her. The. The Gwen. Yeah, she sees yeah, Egwene. Because she's already ruled out Nynaeve. Right, right. So she's watching Egwene. Because I think she can sense the channeling ability in her. Oh, yeah. And she's the same age. She's mm -hmm. the right age. And yeah. And for Taviran. However, Taviran rumors get around. Whatever, yeah, there's four yeah. of them. And she's eliminated the other strong channeler who she can... She, she's eliminated the other like person mm -hmm. that she thinks it is. I like the band. Yeah. I always gotta love a good shot of musicians. Good shot of Fane there, if I can get in on it. Oh, oh yeah, Fane just happily grinning at everyone having a good uh -huh. time right before they all fucking yep. burn. He's like, I'm watching the final moments, because he knows what's coming. Right, he sees all those kids, and he gives them that big, huge, genuine grin, knowing that, like, half of them are gonna die or become orphaned, like, tonight. Yeah. It's awful. He's a horrible person. Uh, the... Excellent actor. Horrible person. Right. <laughs> uh, the wheel, great, great imagery there. Just yeah, circles and circles. Shot from yep. the, that trailer, wonderful. Love the the dancing style for the community. It makes a lot of sense. Uh -huh. Slide dancing. I love just seeing all of them dancing. And Nynaeve doesn't dance, which we only ever hear of, and it's an off screen right. thing. Oh, see now, I'm questioning the pregnancy act of pregnancy now with those shots. Right, like she's not yeah. really nursing. That there's no belly bump there in those that I can tell. So. Gosh, man, I context. I need more of it. Mm -hmm. I do love that outfit, though. Uh, red shirt. <laughs> <laughs> oh, stumbled a little bit. So I do think that got thrown, which is why people didn't see the Trollocs, right? He threw it from outside the circle yeah. of tents, from outside the fires, from the darkness. Yeah, he threw it, but was also running at the same time. Right. Or threw it and then started running. So that way, when the person fell, he could be there to pick right. it up and start going at because I assumed I, every time I've watched it I think it's an arrow because it feels like a very arrow yeah. shot and then it turns out it's actually a, a axe the size of the victim <laughs> and it's all the more horrifying because it's not an arrow your arrows these are archers right. fine but like an axe it's another One level thing we've never we haven't seen any Trolloc archers mm -mm. no and I wouldn't be surprised nope, if, we see them in the books yeah, but I wouldn't be surprised if Trollocs not, do not have the ability to shoot bow and arrow in the series. That would make a lot of sense. And this whole upcoming sequence is just so horrifying. I know. I don't even know it, how to go through it in a, in a spoiler way other than to be like there was a firefight. Right? Like, <laughs> we... It's... <sighs> Yeah, it, it, it's a natural disaster. It's the terror that they bring mm. through it, the chaos and the not knowing what you're doing is something that I think often is missing from sequences like yes. this. And it, it feels like I'm inside a natural disaster and my blood pressure goes up and it's it's horror. It's, horror. it's it, it you. You see the adrenaline. You see how the adrenaline distorts the experience. I'm also really looking forward to seeing a difference between the characters now and their reaction to Trollocs and their reaction to Trollocs once they've leveled up, when Matt has the Ash and Dari, when, when they can channel, like, when Trollocs aren't an issue <laughs> or less of an issue, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, as far as I, the whole thing with Matt, it, it's battle Matt. This is the Matt who goes into battle. Mm. He turns around and runs. He's not running into a flaming building. He's running into a flaming outside of a building. But it's it's that. It's him just being like, blood and flaming ashes. I'm going to go do the heroic thing because I'm no bloody hero. You see the whole drama play out in his eyes when he asks where the girls are and then goes back out into the scene. And I, I love how much he's captured who Matt is. Oh, I, I did have to read this. Fire Phoenix says Egwene pulled both Perrin and Layla into the dance and got them dancing together. I did not notice that. Oh, really? I didn't notice that. I, I did not... Uh, go back and see. Yeah, no, I didn't, did not notice that. I'm kind of curious about that. Let's go back to before everything's on fire. There she gets... Yep. Oh, yeah! So they're not, she grabs them together. It's not like she grabs one and then the other, but she pulls them both in to, to start dancing with her. Uh-huh. Yeah. 
they were standing uh-huh. ever on the edge, and she's like, no, 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 come in. Oh, which is just like, oh, even more complex relationship. Wait, what's going on with the three of them? Yeah. What is going on with the three of them? Okay, so back to... The- I also just want to point out the ruthlessness of Lana Moraine up in the woods, being like, there's a Trolloc attack coming, we need to dip. Yep. And she's like, like, we aren't going to save the Like, we're not going to save the village. We're not going to save these people. Our mission calls for us to leave. And then she's like, small problem. I don't know who to kidnap. So I'm going to have to save the village. Fuck. <laughs> like, the way he stumbles yeah. over a Trolloc and then onto a dead body and then into a fire, it just... This is how it would actually be. You'd be so adrenaline out, you couldn't stand up right. Everything would be chaos. It would be easy to get away from enemies and run into friends. Like, oh, it's so scary. I love the shot of his feet straight up in the air. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> um, who dies here? Do we know who dies? I I want to say it's Senbui, but I don't. Think... <laughs> that was my first yeah. thought too. <laughs> I think it is. I think it's Senbui. To be perfectly honest with you, I think that that's we say goodbye to that man, that actor. Yeah, that's that's a that's a bummer. But yeah, Lan and Moran are so ruthlessly dedicated, whereas Nynaeve and Egwene are like, we're going to just start trying to drag people out of harm's way. Yeah. Like They just go right to work because this is their job. This is Nynaeve's job is protecting the village. And that's she is hating everything that's happening right now. <laughs> Um, and then flash to, I assume, you know, slight flashback or flash sideways to this is what's going on at the same yeah. time at the farm, um, which is someone sent. Very compressed storytelling. Yeah. They don't talk it out. They don't go through all this having the soup descriptions and getting the sword out and talking about Kari. And they just like wordlessly, bam, bam, mm-hmm. bam. You know how the sequence is going to go. Let's move. Narg busts the door down. Yes, it is Narg. Even though it doesn't say anything, it's wolf. It's a wolfy trollic. So it's Narg. And there was a noise out there because I think it was the sheep. I think we missed that noise, but something triggers them to realize. Uh, Bella was running around in, oh. in circles in her thing. Bella, Bella's. Bella gives warning course, because Bella Bella's the creator. Yep. yep. She's got to make sure the, dar- the the dragon reborn survives the initial attack. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. So. Oh yeah, that's Narg. Mm, Wolfie Narg. Narg, a good boy. <laughs> Narg, smart. <laughs> um, we see he gets that initial stab in with the spear. Rand gets him with the bow. Just, he gets thrown against the yeah. thing. Fortunately, Tam doesn't have to go upstairs or anything. The sword happens to be right, right. there. Very convenient. And we don't, like we no real comment from Rand about like, oh, I've never seen that sword before. Yeah, and they, we don't get any conversation about him taking no. it later on. He just has it. Like we just skip all yeah. that. Like, nope, I'm, you don't I'm need it. I'm trying to get a shot of the box, but uh, it's so brief. There we go. All right, so here it comes. So there is the box. Yeah, that's got a heron yeah. on it. There is a heron there's on the box. I yep, saw there's it. There's definitely a heron on the box. There we go. Good shot. Right there. Yeah. 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 So it's very convenient that that's in the same room. He didn't have to do any prep work I, to make that happen. You know, it makes sense to me that there's no upstairs. Yeah. No. Single fam- single room cabin with like attachments. That totally yep. checks yep. out. Yeah. Love and pull out the sword. Oh, the the way he just, he goes into this, like, martial arts stillness and focus and just dances. Mm. It's just like, oh, my God, they read the books. I love this so much. And, like, in the books, he does, he fights off, like, 15 Trollocs. But, again, I like that they're making individual Trollocs more menacing rather than having the Trollocs as be sort of this faceless, almost, like, even from the beginning, people are like, oh, they get nerfed later on. But I'm like, dude, Tam takes out, like, 15 of them with barely a scratch. Like, I know he's a Blade Master, but, like... They're supposed to be menacing, and I like the, that they've added a lot of menace to the Trollocs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, great. The, the wound that has to be healed right there. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I also, like, Narg has blue eyes. Just the blend mm. of human and animal features is just... Very good. They nailed it. It's so creepy. And according to chat, the wiki has that character listed as Senbui, and the credits is listed as Old Man. So, take your pick. We'll find out. Yeah. Um, so yeah. obviously that was poisy poison on the end of the Trolloc blade there. Yep. And what a cruel, yeah. cruel weapon. I mean, that's just 
that is how it is described in the books is cruelly hooked that's what he meant oh <sighs> Um, this scene of the Trolloc, oh, this is such creepy, where it comes Oh, them. God. Uh, I, oh, the running. Oh, God, the running. And this is a, oh, I love that they have them doing yeah. that. The four-legged running? Yeah. yeah, I love that they've included that with, like, you know, 10% of the Trollocs. Oh, God. Uh, I get the feeling they can all do it occasionally if they want to. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, this is the pig snouted Trolloc. And I love the dual scream here. Yeah. <laughs> that I is Nynaeve. That was so a, that might be the moment that Nynaeve won me over. I was like, that's Nynaeve, right? Right, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Oh god, it's so good. Uh, it's so good. And it, it's like she's like, I can threat display too. It's just like when Leia has her tied to a tree, and he's like, Are you in a position to be making demands? She's like, Bitch, I'm making threats. threats. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care what position like, I'm in. She never gives up. <laughs> uh, yeah, and like. They're dodging and weaving and bobbing until Moraine... And hitting it with sticks and, and clearly right. not going to win. And then, yeah, it gets ripped in half by... What a cool what way a, to yep. be saved. So cool. And the music. And the music? Oh, God, the music. And that's the beginning uh, of channeling. Her, She's like... Her battle music is... Oh. I'm sorry to the, any in the audience who wants more coherent words. I can't. <laughs> I, 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 it's been a week and I still cannot right. with the coherency. That's just what it is. That's what you're here for. <laughs> and this to me is the horn blowing moment of the battle. This is when things turn, right? Like this is when all of a sudden the good guys have a chance. We go from being slaughtered, surprised, defenseless to, oh, we have an Aes Sedai on our side with a warder to help her out. Like they are. There's a line earlier. One Aes Sedai can turn a yeah. battle. And then we see an Aes Sedai by herself turn a battle. Completely. Um, so, yeah, just the amazing channeling. We've talked through a lot of this because we've seen some of it. I think this is great. The she ducks while he swings the sword over his head to kill the Trolloc. I, right? Like, she's, like, got her mm. eyes closed and she's doing her, like, Tai Chi magic. But they've worked together so much that she's like, if I duck here, he knows to go yep. here. Like, they just... They have practiced this so much. And she talked about that. The actress did Rosamund Pike in, in interviews, just like how this sort of, this was one of the early shots too in the scene. And this helped them work out a trust as actors between each other. It was one of the first things they actually did together was this scene. Oh man, that's so cool. Yeah. I, I can't keep up with the behind the scenes stuff, but I love getting those tidbits from people who can. <laughs> um, I love this head flick to throw that into a uh, Trolloc's head. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, all the rocks, Dunk. ah, and just bloody gore everywhere. Like entrails everywhere, right. blood. Ev, it's so gross. They're both so serious. And then this. <laughs> She's like, yeah, I've been drinking all day, but I will gut you like a pig, you fucker. This, this is the women's circle coming up behind the battles and slaughtering the Trollocs. This is the true yeah, spirit of, of Emmons. This is where, like, I went, yes! Like, this is the yeah, cheering Daisy moment. Conger Daisy Conger for the fucking right? win. She's a, she is a barbarian tank. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to drink yeah. all day and take down a, a Trolloc. And she couldn't have done it by herself, no. but she rallies the women and... I, I think they brought this forward because they might have to cut the Battle of the Two Rivers later, and Rafe didn't want to mm. risk missing the opportunity to have this piece of the Two Rivers spirit come through. And he's like, no, we're just, we're doing it now. We can reuse it later if we get that scene. If not, it's fine. I also like this blood on the forks already. <laughs> like, they've already taken down a couple of these of them this way. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's, oh, it's so fucking right, good. Right. <sighs> yeah. Days Conger. Um, shame we didn't see any cast iron being used. As a weapon. I was genuinely disappointed yeah. at the lack of Marin Elvier taking people out with a cast iron pan. But yeah, that's sort of the turning point. Things are coming back. Um, and then we get the whole... Oh god, there's just so much. There's so much. Um, trying to think. And then the parent fight. Yeah, so sh she gets everyone out. Yes. Because they have a bunch of people who are hiding in the forge, and then she, like, Lila, like, go, 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 gets them all out, and then turn, and Perrin says go. He wants her he to wants go. He wants her to go, too. And she's like, hell I will, because clearly Perrin inspires loyalty in his spouses. That's just <laughs> a two rivers thing and a Perrin thing. I love the so she, effectiveness of the hammer as a weapon here. 
I love that it's her weapon first. Yeah. She's the one who demonstrates the power of the hammer as a weapon. Really, really effectively. Yeah, very effectively. Swung by a blacksmith. Like a we- blacksmith's weapons in a blacksmith's hands will fuck you up. Um, and yeah, that's also just extremely bloody. Like taking out legs and arms and just like, yeah. Brandon asked, why aren't they hamstringing anyone? I'm like, because they're villagers and they don't know how to do the the war thing. They've never had to do this. And right then, that was when Paris, like did the hamstring. I'm like, see, yeah. they're figuring it out. They're learning. <laughs> um, so yeah, continue. I thought she was going to die there when too. she gets pushed up against the wall. I thought she was going to be gored right. and but, that was going to be how she, she died. And I was sad about it, but that was what I expected. Because her death was expected, right? Like, you and I both knew. Yeah, like, oh, I, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, that one. Just blade to the face. Just right down the middle of the skull. The way he... It's its like Bran describes it in the books. It's like he's ten men. He's everywhere at once, just with his sword. Just, you can't even keep track of him. And the way he works with her power. It, oh, God, they're so good together. Yeah, uh, then the lightning from the sky. Yeah. And she uses the tree. She just fucking torches their tree. She deputizes their tree to be a lightning rod and is like, sorry, I'm just going to foreshadow what Rand does to a Vendasora. It's cool. A little bit of that. Yeah. Um, So there's the tree. She looks so amazing. She looks a lot like um, uh, Contact. What's her name in Contact? Jodie Foster? Yeah, she looks so much like Jodie Foster in Contact in that scene. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Yeah, I can see that. Um, Nynaeve getting dragged away. This is the big change for Nynaeve. Yeah, which... why Nobody else gets dragged off by their hair. Everyone else gets killed on, on the spot. Why does she get dragged away? I assume just food for later. No, I just answered my own question. Oh, she's one of the Because children. Dana says I've been seeing the five of you in my dreams. Nynaeve was ordered to be captured yep. alive. Yep. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes total yep. sense. I, I'm I'm gonna die on that hill now. I just solved my own problem. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and and it also makes me wonder why she doesn't come back to the village. Like it appears she runs, she gets dragged away, she runs away. Unless she's unconscious for a time, and that's closer to the day in the morning after they've already left. Wait, say that again. Why does it take her so long to get back to the village? Why isn't she there in the morning when the Emmons Field Four leave? It's. Honestly, I felt like the light in the scene where she kills the Trolloc was very much like early dawn. Mm-hmm. So I think that <clears throat> I think that her entire adventure does take place over the whole night. Gotcha. And she's like knocked out for a bit and she has to like run a long way to get back to the village. And then she has to deal with the Trolloc. And I think it's early morning by then. So she probably staggers back into the village 10 minutes after the kids take right, off. Something like that. You know, that's what I think. So, yeah, she's gone. But yeah, her getting taken out allows her to rejoin the story in a way that's honestly more efficient, I think, than the the book version. Yeah, and it makes sense um, that she's not... And here we're doing the Layla killing. Wait, we have to talk about Matt finding the kids, though, right? Uh, oh, we missed that already. Damn it, that's way up my notes. Yeah, sorry about that. Sorry. Yeah, just scrolling through. The, um, so much is happening in the battle. Matt finds his sisters and they run off to the big oak in the woods, which is referenced in book four. Yep. That big oak in the woods... That's a real thing from the books. They didn't just make that up. Um, yes. Okay. So Egwene leaves their patient also. Nynaeve and her were dragging someone and then Nynaeve gets taken and Egwene just fucking runs the other way. Like she forgets about the person that they were carrying. She just leaves them. Like. I mean, they were dead already. Again, I'm pretty sure. driving yeah. home the terror of what she's feeling. Like she doesn't even think about abandoning that person. There's no way to car- drag that person on her own. Oh, no, for sure. But she doesn't even agonize over yeah. it. Yeah. She forgets about them. The second she loses Nynaeve, that's the only thing that was holding her together. And she is back to being the terrified little girl from the beginning mm-hmm. of the sequence. Mm-hmm. Still hasn't matured that much. Exactly. She has... Today was the day she decided to go on this path. She's not fucking ready for this shit. <laughs> um, so he, next is... We talked about this a fair amount, but... the. Uh, but yeah, now, now we get into the Layla killing, which I felt when Perrin lost control... It was very obvious cinematically. Yeah. When he loses control. Because he keeps it killing, uh, hitting a dead Trolloc. 
Yeah, even the first blow, I could tell this is the one where he oh, keeps that, going. That, oh, that leg and then oh, face God. combo was great. So they're taking out two of them, I think, in this. They're fighting two. There. So but right there. Yeah. Before the first swing down, like it's just like, oh, he's got he's got the face. That's the face of a man out of control. And I noticed the last time we saw Layla right before that, she was actually getting dragged away by a trollic. Right? So she she kills this one. I think they both kind of fall to the ground together. Right. And so then. Yeah. yeah. So it stabs her in the leg. And that's the one that she just took the face out of. Okay. But as it falls, its horn hooks her on the leg and knocks her over. And that's the. We see her on the floor. And then the next time we see her, she's in the air with the hammer over her head like she's going to swing it. Yeah. Yeah. And Perrin's finding a different one. So yeah, th- that goes down. He's berserking. Yep. We hear the ringing. Yeah. And then we hear a growl, and he turns. Yeah. And she's got the hammer raised, I'm assuming coming behind him to hit the Trolloc, but I've heard this whole Lila is a dark friend theory on Twitter, despite trying to avoid the discourse, and I I, I mean, we can't not talk about it. No, but I don't... I think Rafe has done some pushback on that because it became so popular. He was like, there's more to it, but that dark friend doesn't seem to be where people are going with it. Um, when, when he, I don't think she's dark. Friend. Yeah, I, I don't either. I haven't read the discourse. Yeah. I just know that it keeps popping up and yeah. I'm like, clearly this is popular. I don't like, I don't, it doesn't make sense to no. me. No, it's, the, the, it all comes from the fact that she's swinging that hammer and it appears that all the trolls are dead, right? Like, so who would she swing the hammer at? Parents, the only object in the room. You know, um, I just assumed that she didn't believe the Trolloc was fully dead yet yeah. and was just like, ba- she's also berserking. And like, I'm going to make sure that this thing can't kill my husband. Like, I I just assumed it was a straightforward case of making sure. Yeah, that, I, I kind of think because last we saw her, she was on the ground. The Trolloc fell, grabbed her ankle. Then she got up. Maybe she was smashing its head into the ground or something like that. But yeah, it, it, the angle and the 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 way she's raising the hammer is just a little odd. It's like, what is she, when, when we saw her on the ground, now she's up and swinging a hammer. What happened in between? How did she do that? What puts her in that position? Now, I think it is there mysterious so that like when he swings sideways, we're also thinking like, well, it can't be her. She's on the ground. And so it's startling that she's in the right, ground. Like we right. last saw her on the ground. So, yeah. So, yeah, I just, but this is, First of all, a terrible way to die. Uh, um, yeah, being cut in half by an axe. I, yeah. I mean, did you ever read where the red fern grows? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was the scene that always stuck with yeah. me the most, was the axe in the gut scene. Yeah. Oh, um, that's so brutal. It's so bad. Wow. Um, so, but um, this is this is the time to talk about our fridging segue. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I mean... I, <laughs> Part of me is like, yes, I do want to talk about it. Fridging is this thing where you introduce this character to push parents' plotline ahead. I also don't necessarily want to talk about it to get the context that we've been promised. There's some stuff to talk about it, um, because I did a little research into it because I wanted to be able to talk about it properly. Um, And there's... So first of all, this is the big change that Brandon Sanderson was really not pleased with from what I have read. Mm -hmm. Well, he pushed. He pushed um, to have someone other than like, uh, a wife yeah. that's that guilt. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's important context. Just that's one of the big changes that we know he disagreed about. But I was researching on um, like TV tropes about uh, fridging, and I was like, okay, I feel like this isn't the whole story with Lila, because it just doesn't feel right. And they had a link below that to another trope called Lost Lenore. And this is, it's a reference to an Edgar Allan Poe uh, poem. Um, and it is when a character dies and then their de- their presence stays with the character who lives and influences their decisions going forward. And I think that's actually what's happening here. I think that, because and, and they're related tropes, right? They can go together. Right, Often I, yeah. fridged characters are lost Lenores. Right, but right. I think that that's more what we're going to get from her. Mm-hmm is that it's not that she just dies and that's the end of her story. I think her presence on Perrin 
is going to affect him a lot, and thus she's going to fall into a lost Lenore act of her arc as a problematic right. change. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I should hope that they're going to use it to affect his character, right? Like, otherwise, what this, what's the point? Well, they already have, yeah. with the way that Matt gives him the dagger, with, yeah. with the lesson about that. I mean, she's already in that. And, like, also, I don't know that it is problematic in the sense that I don't know how else they could have done this. Like, I think it would have been awesome if he had killed, like, a child or a mentor instead of a wife. But at the same time, how else are you going to get him to leave his wife behind? Yeah. No, I'm... I, he, you can't take Fayil out. Well, I, I, think you, I think part of the problem is you have to create her and then take her. Like, you didn't have to take her out if you didn't create her in the first place. But that goes back to the aging up thing. Yeah. He was going to marry her. Right. If they stick to the setting of the book and they're aged up, then they've t- and one of the three would have been married. And it can't be Matt and it can't be Rand. And Perrin already had a girlfriend. And it anchors so, like, him in the two rivers. It anchors. Yeah. No, there's. <sighs> yes. Yeah. I see the logic that took us to this place. I don't think. Um, uh, yeah. I just want more context. I think that we both we both settle yeah. on that. That like. This was, it's a fine change, but the heart, to me, what makes it weak is not necessarily the trophy for genius of it, is the fact that she had two lines before she was killed. Like, they never established her as a sympathetic character before they well, killed her Well, that's off. why it's a fridging yeah. thing. That's, that's the point, is that the woman character is reduced to yeah. that. And... I mean, I would have just rather he didn't get I would have rather that none of them got married and they were all being given shit for not getting married rather than, oh, well, at least one of them should have been married by now. Like and then if he killed Master Luhan, that would have made so much more sense. I don't know. Keanu Reeves. Help me out. John Wick. Wick? Yes. Yeah, he could John Wick basically kill his dog and he goes John Wick. I mean, in a lot of ways, (laughs) Perrin already is John Wick because, you know, they kill Hopper and he goes John Wick on the, the White Cloaks. Yeah. And that's another trope that's related to these things is the rampage of revenge mm, mm-hmm. that often follows from fridging and lost Lenores. That's there's there's a whole ecosystem here. His fridging is a little different in that someone else doesn't kill his wife. He kills his own wife. And so he can't like mm-hmm. go on a revenge rampage against. Yes, for sure. Yeah. But with the white cloaks, there's yeah. when they kill Hopper in the books. And, and 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 that's the other thing is. Killing the White Cloaks always felt like a really weird albatross to hang around his own neck for Perrin. Like, they're just some random assholes and you kill them in self-defense. Right. Like, the emotional impact that he brings to that always felt a little out of proportion. And so the weight is a lot heavier with killing someone he knows. Yeah. I think they were just the first people he killed, right? Sure. But this compresses his storytelling. Mm-hmm. And the other cool thing is it allows Matt to give him the philosophy of weapons over tools rather than having this be this 8, 12 book internal process for Perrin. It's just handed over as this little nugget of wisdom from a character who can't, like, continue to affect him with new actions. So, like, that's really tidy storytelling when Matt gives that whole spiel on Lila's behalf. Like, I hate that they're using a dead wife to deliver it, but... Damn, does it cut corners. Okay. Ah, I More context will definitely help. Shall I move past <laughs> this moment? Um, it's, again, she's not holding her wound. She's holding her belly next to the And wound. she's holding his hand. Yeah. Well, that's pinky. He's got a very large hand. <laughs> uh, she dies. He breaks down. Uh, we get her looking for Nynaeve. Oh, we learned that Bran hasn't died. I assumed yeah. that her anguished face there was over oh, Bran, because right. I, of course, didn't anticipate Nynaeve being stolen. Right, right. Nynaeve so. dying, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. We did speculate that that was uh, Bran's death they were reacting to. I was like, who else would she be distressed over? Yeah. It can't be Nynaeve, because yeah. Nynaeve stayed there. Duh. Um, some more fighting with Lan and... Oh. And then Moraine gets the, the knife, knife in the shoulder, yes. which... The way she, like, bends down and, and he, like, catches her and then she pulls it out. Like, and he's like, we have to go. And she's like, watch me pull this out and not go. Look at that knife. <laughs> uh, another thrown weapon. Again, suggesting that the axe was thrown into that yep. first victim. Yeah. And that's that's a through and through. Does that go through all the way through? 
Doesn't look, Doesn't like, look it. like it. Okay, so I did think it was through and through, but okay, so the wound is just in the front. And, yeah. and here, I guess that is mostly muscle if it's low enough. I feel like there's it's... major arteries and stuff through there. Yeah, I mean, I am white enough to be translucent, and I have some pretty big veins, <laughs> like, under my skin that I can see going through yeah. there. Because uh -huh. um, you, you said you had some questions about that and how it she stays alive. Well, specifically because of the poison. Yeah. It's a, got trollic poison, and she doesn't die for days and days. She pulls this, like, Frodo thing. She gets the Frodo wound. On her, she's having the weathertop moment. She's the one fucking wheezing because she's got a shoulder wound from a stabby stab from an evil person. But she, it's presented as a poison that will kill you very quickly, and yet she lasts for days and days and days. So I'm wondering if maybe they're not saying a channeler has some endurance from being a channeler. Yeah, or from being bonded to a warder, maybe. maybe. I, I suppose um, it's not supposed to go that direction, but... Well, maybe they're changing it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's got to be something about being an Aes Sedai that, that changes that for her. <laughs> And so he pulls that out. No, she pulls it out. I'm pretty sure that's his hand. Oh, wow. I can't, I can't make my hand. She's pulling it out of her it. own shoulder? Yeah. That's insane. Yeah, so she looks at him with this look that says, fucking try me, we're not leaving, and pulls it out herself. Wow. And he's like, I always thought he pulled it out. the eyes said I. Nice catch. Nope. Nice catch. She's a goddamn badass. Great shots of the Trollocs. I honestly really want a panning... Sh I want someone to match a panning shot of the Trolloc faces with a paragraph from RJ describing mm. the the beaks and talons and weapons because I think they're giving us literal shot-for-shot -shot versions of those paragraphs. I, I want that to be paired together. <laughs> um, and then we get the use of the Wine Spring Inn as a projectile weapon. Um, she throws Which the is the so cool. We see these two Trollocs coming up behind her, and Lan protects her from those two. Um, and then she starts pulling down the power from the fire, in particular. It's interesting that she pulls the power from things. The yeah. The world around her. The essence of the world mm -hmm. around her. And like, she, yeah, and then just... Yank. She has to work with what she's got. Yeah. And it also suggests that there are limitations. She can't just make infinite boom boom. Right. She has to work with things. The power itself can't do the same harm as the power fueling a rock. Or creating lightning or... Right. Fire. She's being able to shoot a fireball mm -hmm. because she has called on fire. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, channelers don't get sick in this world, right? Then he talks about never getting ill. Oh, yeah. You know? so, like, that is kind of an eye of the worldism, uh -huh. but we are in the eye of the world currently. So, And it, it's a good one to bring forward, honestly. Right. So the channeling gives you so. some ability to, to sustain wounds or something like that. Yeah. Well, also, channeling helps divorce you from your body so you That's can ignore true. pain until you stop channeling. So there could be some natural immunity and strength plus channeling. That's a good point. The, buff, the, a channeling buff. Maybe the wound is that bad. She's just ignoring it. I, yeah. I almost wish she'd left the blade in during the battle, and because once you pull it out, then you start to bleed freely. But the poison might uh, be a good yeah. reason to like Wait, are, flush. Are, that are we shit sure out? that that shoulder was that blade was poisoned? Does they say that was poisoned? Because it, it was a throwing blade, so I wonder if it was like a cleaner, just like a normal throw, thrown blade. Like, because Tam's is certainly but there's poisoned. like black stuff Could just on be the wound. Faction? I, I'm i not sure. Yeah. I'd be a lot happier if it was a clean blade yeah. because I don't like her surviving for days and days and days with Same. an infected wound. I like her managing to hold on despite major arteries being cut because she's a Aes Sedai. Also, the fact that that arm is like straight out, like with the shoulder wound. There's a certain amount well, of... Well, she's, like, she's fully adrenaline out right now. Enough. So, um, but Nynaeve does talk about poison later. Okay. Um... But also, wounds will poison themselves. Right, right. Blood poisoning that, is that's an infection. Could it be considered poison? Yeah, but yeah, uh, she's done. We'll say see if I, we if. Go ahead. Uh, we'll we'll see if um, if when the eyes said I heal her, if they mention yeah. what kind of wound she's got. 
Um, so then Rand coming into town with Tam on Bella, which is different. In again, in the books, he has the litter that he has to make and drags, and Bella's just in town right already because Bella ran mm-hmm. back to town when the Trollocs attacked. Right, right. Here, I was, I was, mm, good. Yeah, I was so just to go back to the in collapsing. I love how Lan is waiting to jump on her and protect her from the debris field. Yes, yeah. He's crouched behind her because he's like, okay, that's what she's doing, and she knows I'm right behind her, so she won't hit me with a rock. But when this building falls, she's gonna have spent all her energy, so I she will be expecting me to come forward and like protect her from debris. And the hand over the eyes mark. first. Like eyes are very important mm-hmm. for an ice and eye, so make sure you protect those so she can channel and mm-hmm. see where she's channeling. Um, also, yeah. the parallel between her falling and the building collapsing, that she goes to her knees, the building falls, and then she goes down, and the building goes down. Yeah, like, yeah the, the great... Um, reminds me of when... Um, not Tammuz. Uh, Tamanis uh, fires the cannons and then falls after he gets his murdral wound, and mm-hmm. um, him hitting the ground is the same as the wall of Camelin hitting the ground. Because yeah. he uses the cannons to blow it up, and then he, he collapses, and they collapse together, and the world shook. Because he introduces cannons yeah. to the world, basically, <laughs> the, the usefulness of them. Um, and yeah. so, yeah, there's a, there's, a, there's a parallel there of, like, yeah, falling to your knees and remembering the full falling of the wall. Um, yeah. So that, that And she's really willing to spend herself. Mm-hmm. Like, that's part of what that sequence shows, too, is she's like, I am going to use up all my spell slots and all my inspiration dice and, like, everything is out. And this is only the first battle. I have to get these five to Tarvalin, but I have a wound and I'm totally, you know, destroyed. It's just she's she's not up to this whole task. She really fails um, at her mission. She's got three saving hard. throws or else she's toast. Yeah, right? <laughs> and then when Rand shows up, the destruction, because there's just, there's just blocks thrown across the whole village. It's like this, it's not just that the village burned down. There's this very signature and Aes Sedai was here yeah. kind of chaos. Dis- distribution. One thing I noticed is there are no Trolloc bodies left. Yeah. And that, I'm guessing they've already... That actually, I thought they would have helped their own first before removing the Trolloc bodies. Yeah, At, that's a little funky. Yeah, I would expect some bodies to still be there. To be to be honest with you. Yeah, I agree that that's a unfortunate cost saving corner that they cut. I think because like you'd have to move the big rocks off the bodies to drag them away, and it's like yeah, let's let them rot while we heal people. Yeah, deal with our yeah. Yeah. So anyway, that's that's that was just a thought I had when I saw these boulders sitting there. I was like, where are all the dead trollocs? Yeah, oh, I don't see them. Okay, oh well, that's that's yeah. choice. They they are in the budget for something more important. Because like in in that's the books, they, they talk about burning the bodies and there's a big bonfire and they cover their noses and the smells atrocious and you know, there's a whole Tom scene with that and like so there's no dealing with the bodies here. And then the reason that Tam can't get help without a nice to die is not because Nynaeve triages him but because she's not there. And it cuts out him going to Bran and getting advice from Tom, who Tom tells him to go seek the Aes Sedai and gives him advice about Aes Sedai. And then we have the whole discussion about the bargain. And if, yes, if you do this, I'll do whatever you want. That all just gets... Just gone. Also, when she hugs him, her ring looks like a little Aes Sedai ring. So they... So yeah, they get him down to a bed. And then Egwene just goes and gets Nynaeve. Or it gets Moraine and is like, come fix this guy. She's like, okay, done. Yep. Like, it, so fast. Yeah. It, 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 you get a feeling she's just healing people left and right. But you don't, you don't get the, yeah. the weight of it. You do see her be exhausted afterwards, though. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. And then freaking Matt's parents, so ungrateful. Thank the light. Thank Matt. Yeah, right? Please. No, he's a no good, nothing good for... Like, <sighs> it, you know, when he does something right, it's somebody else's uh, reward. When he does something wrong, it's his fault. So, can never can never be, win ever. His father is such an interesting looking actor. Like I was gonna say, I, he, I need to see that face giving us a monologue at some yeah. point. He cannot only be in the background, <sighs> right? Well, and and like I'm fine with changing Abel Coffin because Abel Coffin was just Tam Light, right? Like yeah, for sure, for sure. I'm just saying they cast that actor. I need to yeah. see him having some real screen right. time because that's too interesting looking of a person to just relegate to nothing. I wouldn't mind seeing a redemption arc on his part. Yeah, like he becomes an actual general or whatever. Like, no, there's... Oh, I I need... I just need him to have a, a story. 
And maybe like Perrin's the one who whips him into shape. That would be kind of funny. <laughs> they save each other yeah. or whatever. Yeah, totally. I'm I'm super down with that. But yeah, he has a certain like he's got a very long, interesting face. Um, he reminds me of somebody that I'm trying to think of, but I can't. Kind of like Clancy Brown, a little bit, but like not really. Mm. Probably somebody else. Kind of like Clancy Brown though. Um, Perrin brings out his wife, who everyone has assumed was killed by a Trolloc, because. And and Matt calls out to him, and Rand looks around. Like the boys, their their bond, yeah. it it's still here. And at least they're they're friendly. Uh, man, I, I'm amazed how mo how little. Ch I thought that battle was like sixty percent of the episode, but it's only ten out of fifty minutes. It's like I really was amazed at how little of the actual it, it occupies such a big part. They did it of the episode. really efficiently. They were really really good. You can see the um, black around his eyes from where the the because remember the troll kicked up the sparks into his eyes. Oh yeah. So he was, pretty, he was blinded during the fight, which is partially mm -hmm. why he couldn't see what he was swinging at. And you can see the ash around mm -hmm. his eyes where that that happened. Yeah, there's a lot less blood on his face now. He's wiped off some of it. Mm. It, that is one of those things that I think is really hard to be consistent with because it's like from shoot to shoot, like you have a splatter, but how do you recreate a blood splatter on like three days later on a different scene? Eh, I mean, you can, you, but you, it's, you, a, it's lot a lot of work. work yeah. So I think yeah, I just go for a slightly cleaner face. When he was like sweating and crying right. for hours, like wash a bit of that off. I, I I hope we get more story about like the sword and the blood snow and and ooh. we've seen the flashback to the blood snow. We've seen the blood snow, so like we assume that I assume that's going to be him, uh, Tam telling the story, and we're gonna flashback to him telling the story and then flashback to the story. <laughs> It'll be a double flash. We'll we'll inset that it. would be very in keeping with this book. <laughs> and so then. They have this extremely convenient, everyone happens to be standing there mm -hmm. so she can info dump and they all agree. But again, for the sake of storytelling time, let's not waste our screen time and our budget on a scene. We all can see how right. it goes. No, I, let's I, just skip ahead. I do. This is where I, I think a extended pilot would have helped a flesh out this flesh out the scene with an extra five minutes, flesh out a few of the earlier, um, you know, flesh out. The walk back like there i think it wouldn't be that hard to add an, a half an hour of clips to this to have a slightly more fleshed out beginning that didn't feel as rushed yeah a 90 minute pilot Would, 120 minute pilot yeah, yeah yeah that's that's all like it's i don't in no way is there anything in the pilot that i don't think needed to be cut i think the other way i think i just some of those scenes could have breathed a little bit and i would have been a lot happier yeah so. yeah yeah, I agree, and it's probably all editing. It's not that they didn't film it. No, yeah, I think it's editing, and I think it's I think it's contractual obligations. I think that um, I hope we either get a cut scenes, flashbacks, or you know, an extended edition at some point, right? Like, Shut up and take my yeah, money. Well, you you can fleece me for that shit. I will pay. I will absolutely. Pay. <laughs> I'm just telling you right now, Amazon. I will pay. <laughs> so um, give me some more yeah. rivers. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. I know you. And the, uh, yeah. The next thing I have is when she laughs at, at Matt. Are like, you out of your mind? And she looks at him like, you have no fucking idea. <laughs> oh. Foretelling. Looks like it works Yeah. This one woman was born with eyes so white she couldn't see anything, and yet she could still see with the foretelling. The mm -hmm. foretelling seems to be restricted to this one particular eye to die. Or women like her yeah. who have extraordinary gifts and have a more traditional, the people who see the future are disadvantaged at seeing in the real world. Like, that's a very common fantasy exchange. And, uh, yeah, I love it. Mm -hmm. Love it, love it, love it. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, it, it, it makes me wonder if we're going to see fewer prophecies. Um, maybe Min doesn't quite give us as many. Right? Maybe because, like... If we don't have, if uh, uh, Elida is not spouting prophecies, if foretelling is not just a common thing, maybe we do get a little less of that foreshadowing, which would make sense to me. A lot of that foreshadowing works really well in a book form, but is less vital and, and restricts what you can do in the show that forces you into a corner if you have those prophecies. Yeah, I think they can keep some. Yeah. Um, and, and not lose anything as far as the texture of the world goes. Right. I agree. 
Yeah, and all the prophecies would be gender gender neutral because it would say the dragon reborn. You know, the dragon doesn't necessarily refer to a person. Yeah, it's probably referred to in some sort of royal, you know, yeah. like way more often than not. Just anyhow, yeah. so yeah. But I was also part of when when Moraine laughs at Matt. It makes me think about how Moraine, <laughs> Moraine, how Rosamond uh, told Rafe that she gets this woman. Yep, and she can do it. I'm like. That that face that right face there, there. That's Moraine. She knows she gets this woman. Yeah. She can be this woman. She was Rafe was so right mm-hmm. to take her on for this role. Oh God, I love that. Fight. No, that I, I fell in love with that, that smile. Thing. Yeah, when Matt, she's like, <laughs> "You've got no idea." And you, <laughs> she's yeah. like, "I'm about to fucking kick you yeah. in the ass so hard." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's as much bearing teeth as it is a, a grin. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. She's oh god, she's so more. I'm, I'm I ready, love her so she's much. Like ready to tear his throat out with her teeth, just like the Trollocs did. Yeah. She's like, try me, try me, motherfucker. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> Fuck her on and find out. <laughs> Yeah, the definition of a wolfish grin, to quote chat. Yes. And then, sort of to spur them on, this is again a difference, that we have this second wave of Trollocs, which we assume came from the Waygate. Like, how did they get here so fast, Waygate? Yeah, they're sending parties through the Waygates, because yeah. they can't send too big of a party, because the Black Wind will eat them. They have to come in waves. That is necessary. Um, yeah. And yeah, so that sort of cuts off any discussion about staying and saying goodbye and debating and having that like do I or don't I leave thing it's like they're coming down the hill get on your horse or they're gonna literally kill you and they clearly have long enough to get horses saddled and to make a very quick hug like there is a sense that a few minutes have passed yes one would assume one can see these trollocs from many miles away yeah, exactly, exactly. And and then we have the thing where the kids don't just vanish in the night. The whole village sees them mm-hmm. leave and hears why they have to leave. And gives a nod and like... Yeah. And, and the other really interesting thing about the sequence is that we don't see anyone waving Perrin off. Not the Luhans, not the Ibaras. There is nobody to for him to look back at and say goodbye mm-hmm. to. Even though he mentions his parents will look in on Matt's sisters. Right, right. But they aren't there to to see him off, and the Luhans aren't either. I'm really like, where are the Luhans? I don't think Why there do are. The Luhans well, obviously exist? the Luhans don't exist, right? Like, I it's, that no, frustrates me yeah. that he doesn't have a mentor figure in the village. Mm. It it just doesn't. I don't like it. That's why we need more context for Layla and what was going on. How, why is she the blacksmith? Why is he helping her and not the other way around? Like, what's, was she, is she older? Did she have an apprentice? Did she, maybe she came to town as the blacksmith and he was apprenticing to her? Like, as, and that's how they became, got into a relationship and that's how, you know, the pregnancy happened, right? Like, I don't know. Maybe she's a little bit older. Yeah. Oh, God. Give us the context. Right. So, yeah, then everybody leaves, and we see the Trollocs. And they changed the opening paragraph. They they removed one line for no fucking reason at all. And I don't appreciate which it. Which line did they remove? I, I, um, say, I forget. It's somewhere near the end. They just fucking took one line out of the paragraph, and it Probably just, just for timing. It, I they had time. <laughs> I'm calling it. They had time. <laughs> An age yet to come, an age long past. They you didn't have to take that out. That was unnecessary. It's a really good line. It's important to emphasize that time is circular. Right. The wheel of time. You took out the line that says time is a circle. Why would you do this? I love that that's the that's what you're getting most upset about. Like out of all the changes they've made, removing one of those lines from the iconic paragraph, you're like, no <laughs> I riot, I quit, we're done. <laughs> uh, this this is how much I love this series, is that's what's pissing me off. Right, this is how much I love the adaptation, is the, the that's yeah. what's pissing me off. You know, like there's there's colorism, there's fridging, there's all kinds of problems. But that editorial choice is the real fucking problem. <laughs> I yeah, and I just gotta say, going through this again, I think now this this is probably my th- I did three rewatch three watches, maybe four altogether. Um and then this going through, I really, every time I've appreciated episode one more and more and more, instead of focusing on what it's not, I've been able to focus on what it is. And I, and it's a great beginning to a great show. Yeah. 
I this is my third go through. I, I've only, I mean, I've, I've only watched it once properly, once while taking notes, and now once with you. Um, I have so many more watches to do. I am so in love. I'm so excited, and th this is a hell of a beginning. Mm -hmm. Now I can't wait to watch something. with more context and all the flashbacks yeah. that were flashbacks that I know we're gonna get, um, mm -hmm. and see, just watch things unfold. Uh, you know. It, you haven't read Stormlight Archive, but he opens that with a night, uh, a, a sort of a party, basically. And all our main characters are at that party. And each new book, he reveals a different POV that changes the context of the party entirely with every book. And so oh, that's I, fun. It's, it's a really fun sort of thing that he's created as Sanderson. And I wonder if they're going to do something like that with Winter Night, where it's like, we've seen Winter Night, but have you seen winter night yet and we already have gotten a little bit of that with the whole Nynaeve twist which is yeah. we thought we knew what happened on winter night with Nynaeve assuming you haven't read the books and you know she's going to be alive and a mm -hmm. major character um you know and then episode three opens with nope or episode two ends with nope she's alive you don't you didn't get everything that happened on winter night on winter night and we're going to keep throwing yeah. that at you okay we're gonna have to go through the whole series again once you know at the end of uh season one and then at the end of <laughs> I mean, over and over and over. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it, yeah. We're going to have to decide how many times we want to go through it because the opportunities are going to be immense. It's kind of like when the books were coming out and you had to reread all the books before it. Yeah. So, like, and obviously we'll rewatch, but do yeah. we repodcast? Like, right. where, where do we go back and... I think maybe we, as we see things, we do go back and highlight. I don't think we'll have to re-podcast the whole season, but maybe in season two, if we get information, we're like, remember in season one, and maybe we bring that up. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we'll we'll figure well, it out, it's and depend. you guys will be here with us. <laughs> Thank you for joining us on this journey. Yeah, that we're was gonna fun. keep yelling about it. Um, but yeah, I think at three hours, um, my final comment is I fucking love the end credit <laughs> music. <laughs> um, it's just so good. I am just so over the moon about everything too. to do with this. I am too. That like, like we've talked about it, like. That was our least favorite of the three episodes. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we are currently at, uh, yeah, th Jesus, that is three hours of actual recording. Oh, yeah. no, I yep. have to edit that. that... Well. <laughs> um... Oh, boy. All right, folks, I'm going <laughs> to say goodbye. I've got some work ahead of me. Um, we have two more episodes to react to. Let's go ahead and uh, do that right now. <laughs> uh, well, uh, we can cut recording and, and we'll regroup. Talk about, How about that. that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much to everybody for joining us. Yeah, this has been an absolute thanks, blast. I had no idea we were going to go this long, but we have. I did. I thought we'd make it to two hours. I didn't think we were going to take a whole three hours on this thing. Wow. <laughs> Uh, remember to like and subscribe. Follow us on social media. Find the podcast. Um, Rewatch the series. Put positive reviews on every platform you can find because assholes with an agenda are putting a lot of negative reviews out there. So please go positively review the show if you feel at all inclined. Um, and yeah, come back to the channel for more content from us in the not too distant future. At this point, if you're still watching this video, Go rate the damn thing five stars. It's giving you that much entertainment. <laughs> like, <laughs> you're still yeah. here. Please go rate it. Yeah, <laughs> um, that's it's worth it. I, I I legitimately believe this is a five star show. Oh, you know, if I could give it more stars. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah, like, comment, subscribe, rate, review, end recording. <laughs> Donate on Patreon. Don't need a Patreon. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Wheel of Time Spoilers podcast. Rate us in the Apple Podcast app or support us on Patreon. Is that good enough?